Well, thank you all for joining us for the second Southeast Doctoral Student Consortium. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Vishal Gupta and I'm on the faculty of the University of Alabama. We have an exciting set of activities today, uh, including presentations, uh, breakout sessions, student presentations, uh, faculty method presentations, and even a social slash mixer at the end. Uh, I've never done a Zoom mixer, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, I hope you'll enjoy uh, the lineup of activities we have uh, as much as we hope you will. Um, feel free to ask questions anytime. You can unmute yourself to ask a question or use uh, or raise your virtual hand through Zoom. I think Zoom is an option to raise your hand virtually uh, or use the chat option to ask questions. Whatever works best for you, please, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, I want to say that especially to first and second year doctoral students, because I know they have, you know, when I was in the first or second year, I was always hesitant to ask questions. So please, please feel free to, to ask questions. Um, if you can keep your video on, if you, if that's a problem, at least keep a profile picture uh, so that we we can all see what each you know what everyone looks like and we build a sense of community uh, as much as possible in these trying times of of covid so without much further ado i'm going to take this opportunity to invite my co-conspirator in all of this uh, jack dr jack walker of auburn university to say a few words and from there we'll pass it on to the other schools jack that's good yeah so i think we're uh vishal asked us to just take a couple minutes and introduce ourselves um so my name is jack walker i am a professor in the department of management at auburn university uh i wanted to thank vishal for organizing this event he definitely did all the heavy lifting uh, it was last summer i believe that he contacted me initially uh, to see if we were interested in getting our students and their students together uh, for a small consortium and Mississippi State ended up joining us in Tuscaloosa and all the feedback I got was very positive. So I think everybody had a great time. Everybody thought it was uh, very uh, well done and, and beneficial. Obviously, uh, we're unable to do an in-person event this year. Uh, hopefully, we can return to an in-person event Maybe in fall of 2021, uh, if that is the case, uh, Auburn is planning to host. So um, assuming things get back to normal, uh, you, can, you can plan to hear from us uh, with regard to plans for uh, another consortium in fall 2021. Uh, so Vishal asked the uh, faculty members from the, the, the major universities to uh, tell a little bit about themselves, why they became a professor and why they think it's important uh, to be involved in this type of event. Um, so a little bit about myself. I got my undergraduate degree at Georgia Tech. Uh, I got my MBA at Auburn. Uh, and during that time, I started working with some of the professors in the management department. And I got very interested in their research. And I was interested in the fact that they had a lot of freedom in what they wanted to research. There wasn't somebody telling them what they had to do. They had a lot of flexibility there. Uh, and that was very attractive to me. So that's kind of what drove me towards a career in academia. Um, got my first job at Radford University, a smaller kind of teaching university in Virginia. And I was there for about a year and a half. Uh, and then I moved to Texas Tech uh, for about three and a half years, and I was fortunate to get a, an offer to come back to Auburn in 2012. Uh, most of my research is in the area of uh, human resource recruitment and selection. Um, I like to do stuff looking at how organizations can manage job seekers' perceptions. I like to look at issues about, you know, what makes an organization attractive to job seekers, that type of thing. Uh, as far as this consortium, I think it's a great idea, a great opportunity for students to meet and to interact with other students in a very informal type of environment. So, you know, you guys get the opportunity to, to learn from some method experts, you get the opportunity to present your research, but it's not pressure filled like you might feel, uh, feel at Academy of Management, PSYOP, or some of the other 
uh, you know, larger conferences. So, I, I, again, I think it's a great opportunity to network. Um, I think you'd be amazed. I continue to be amazed at how small the academic world is. You know, you're going to hear the names of people on this agenda for years to come uh, for publishing, for presenting at Academy. Um, so getting to know them and networking at this point, I think is going to prove to be very beneficial to you guys. Um, so that's about all I have. Uh, who's up next, Vishal? I, I don't have my agenda in front of me. I think you're still on mute. I think Ben goes next. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, I guess I'll, uh, I'll briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ben McClarty. I'm uh, an assistant professor here at Mississippi State University. And uh, this is my fifth year at Mississippi State. Um, I did my undergraduate degree and my MBA at Oklahoma State University. So I'm originally from Oklahoma, grew up in Oklahoma, um, spent most of my life in Oklahoma. When I was finished with my MBA, I worked in financial services marketing for nearly 10 years and uh, was very happy doing that actually. Um, but uh, while I was doing that, I, I still lived in Stillwater and, and still had connections with the university and was given the opportunity to adjunct teach and uh, really kind of got a taste for teaching and liked, liked the environment. And I had a lot of friends who were going through the PhD program in management at OSU and decided that maybe I wanted to pursue this career and this lifestyle and learned a little bit about uh, what research was all about from a guy named Don Klumper. And uh, he encouraged me to apply to PhD programs across the country, including LSU, which is where he was um, working at the time. So I applied to LSU and got into the program down there. And of course he immediately moved on, which is something else we all learn is that nobody seems to stay anywhere too long, but hey, that's how our field works. So I did my PhD at LSU, spent five years in Baton Rouge, had an amazing time and uh, made a lot of great connections there, met a lot of great people that are all over the country now. And uh, when I finished there, I got my first job at West Texas A&M out in the Panhandle, Texas, not very far from Texas Tech, actually. So uh, Jack and I have that in common. Um, after spending a little time there, I took the job here at Mississippi State. And now I am uh, given the task of being the PhD program co-coordinator with Mr. or Dr. I'm sorry, Dr. Mel Fugate, who is also on this call. So uh, he's uh, available to speak to as well. And I'm really excited about this opportunity today just to uh, connect with some of you all at these other institutions and um, kind of learn about you and what your interests are. And also for our students here at MSU to, to have the chance to, to present some of their ideas and to, to learn some new things from some people that they haven't had the chance to talk to before in a really low stakes environment. So I really consider this an opportunity to, to share without feeling like you're going to be uh, um, in, in one of those situations where somebody might uh, intimidate you. So that's what I'm looking forward to. So um, I, think, uh, I think I'm supposed to pass it off to Maria. I'm not sure if Maria's on yet. She is. Okay. Maria, you go next. You go, yeah. You go next, Maria. Okay. Got to unmute. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Gondo. Uh, I am the PhD coordinator at the University of Mississippi, and I want to thank you guys for uh, including us in the invitation. Um, and I, too, want to welcome everyone and say I hope you find this experience useful. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just start. I'm going to get my background and instead start with uh, why I think conferences are great. So, the most obvious reason I enjoy taking part in conferences is because it offers you a chance to network uh, and research is just more fun to have others to collaborate with. But then I try to think about what I might say that would be unique to me. And I'm a qualitative researcher. So one of the reasons I love attending conferences is because I see research as storytelling and conferences offer me a chance to make sure that what I'm saying resonates. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking that I don't do storytelling, I do science. But 
if you want to get published, all research is storytelling. And at a conference, you might find that what you're saying just isn't resonating with your audience. And while it may be that your idea is terrible, I would argue that it's probably much more likely that if you're sharing some research that you really believe in, that the reason it isn't resonating is because the story you're telling just isn't optimal yet. So for instance, maybe your hook means you need to emphasize X instead of Y, or maybe you need to spell out part of your theory and assumptions rather than that part, or you thought your target audience would be X, but really is probably gonna be Y. So I love that conferences provide me the opportunity to share my ideas and test out if the story I'm telling, telling resonates with the audience. And if it doesn't, then it gives me a chance to adjust my framing early in the process. So in sum, I hope you two take this opportunity to test out some of the stories you're telling to see if they resonate with your audiences, be they a single person you're chatting with informally or through a formal presentation. And maybe in the process, you'll even walk away with a new person to collaborate with on research in the future. So hope everyone's having going to have a good conference. And I think, is there one more person or am I the last? Yeah, Peter goes next. Thank okay. you, Megan. Peter Harms? Yeah, I'm Peter Harms. I'm the co-coordinator for the PhD program at the University of Alabama with uh, Dr. Gupta, who's hosting this. Um, uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm originally from uh, the Vancouver area of Canada. I got my PhD at the University of Illinois in psychology. And uh, I think that that's relevant because it kind of brings in uh, one of the important things that we're trying to accomplish today, which is uh, when I transitioned over into management, uh, I had no friends, allies, or really knowledge of management. And I think that probably the most valuable thing about conferences, and this isn't really a conference, but it sort of is, is your ability to network with other people and develop those networks. And that's, you know, when you come into a field and you don't have any networks, you realize how important they are. Uh, my students have all heard me talk about this, which is, you know, when I think about my publication record and particularly early in my career, it was hugely a function of people who you meet, uh, getting to know about special issues, uh, meeting the editors and things like that, and just having that opportunity to reach out and make connections. And so I'm hopeful that today is that opportunity uh, for a lot of people here. The other thing you realize when you transition disciplines is all of the things that you don't know and all the things you know that other people don't know. Uh, and so that can be an opportunity for a situation like this as well, because we all get trained in our own departments with sort of localized experts and certain things. And this is really an opportunity sometimes for you to share your ideas with people, to find out, you know, what the rest of the field thinks about them outside of that bubble. And it, you know, should give you a better sense of, you know, how do I need to adjust? How do I need to pitch things? How do I need people to see the importance of it? Because it might make a lot of sense to people who have the same training and background in networks as you, but maybe not other people. Uh, so I'm hopeful today that you guys take the opportunity to get to know one another, to get to know the faculty, uh, to learn a little bit. And, uh, you know, I think all of us are more than willing to take emails or phone calls if you've got questions about things later on. Uh, so feel free to do that, and I will plug right now because I'm on uh, a stage. I'm doing a special issue on nursing for Journal of Managerial Psychology, so if anyone's doing nursing research, uh, look up our call for papers. Uh, papers are due in February. Thank you, Peter. Um, we are at 2.15 now, so this is a good time to transition to the next uh, next event, uh, the next uh, part of the program, which is our keynote speaker. The keynote speaker for today is Dr. Brian Connolly of Auburn University, who's also the editor-in-chief of the prestigious Journal of Management. To be honest, if I tried to introduce Dr. Connolly, I could go on and on and on, and that would be the next 30 minutes in itself. But I will just say this, if you Google his name, uh, you will quickly see how prolific of a researcher he is and with wide ranging research interests. And with that brief introduction, I will now invite Dr. Connolly to deliver the keynote for today's consortium. Brian? Thank you, Vishal. My mom never went to high school. 
She is a brilliant lady. Uh, she's written several books. She was on vaudeville. And <laughs> she's just a riot. I mean, she's, she's 92 and just incredibly funny. But she grew up in the Depression era, and right around the time that World War II came around, everybody uh, went to work in the factories. So that was before she was high school age. She was working, making rubber rafts in a factory. She tells this story of how uh, kids used to come around with these spoons. She and her friends, they'd go and they'd all grab a spoon and they'd go down to the market and there'd be these giant vats and she'd describe how the vats were much bigger than she was, but that together they'd flip them over and she'd crawl inside these vats and, and try to get the ice cream that was left over in the vats that was thrown away behind the market. It's a wonderful story of how she grew up in poverty. At the end, you're crying. <laughs> or if she tells another story, at the end, you're laughing a deep down belly laugh. And that's a gift that she's, she's given to me, is storytelling. And it has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about today, but Michelle talked about storytelling. And I said, that's important. I want to highlight that because uh, it's so critical to our writing. A lot of times we will get consumed with following the format of a journal and we'll, we'll try to follow the formula that has been successful and we forget that we're telling a story uh, and, and people are either going to be engaged or disengaged with your story. I'm reminded of when I was a doctoral student at Texas A&M and Murray Barrick was, uh, he was interviewing for a job. If you're on the OB side, you know Murray. I mean, he's, he's a big OB researcher. And yeah, he actually got the job. He moved from Iowa to Texas A&M. But when he was interviewing, he was doing his job talk and he talked about uh, first impressions. He had done research on first impressions and he had talked about how we, when you, you shake a person's hand and, well, I guess that was pre-COVID, right? Um, and and you, you say a couple of words that we make these assessments about people. And, and then he described how this happens in the review process, that when we get a paper, we make initial assessments about a paper very quickly. Uh, and a lot of those assessments are based on the story that you're telling. How do, are, are you engaging people in your story from the very beginning? And what was interesting about his research is he said, as you get further into the paper and you start looking at the hypotheses and the arguments for the hypotheses and the, and the data that they use in the example, you're no longer asking, is this a good paper? That's not your question. Your question is, how far away from my initial assessment am I willing to move? Which is why that initial assessment, how you frame the story of your paper is so critical. Um, so again, it has nothing to do with what I wanted to talk about, but I thought that was interesting. So uh, let me, can, can I share my screen, screen Vishal? That did it. And now uh, let's see. How's that? Am I sharing my screen now? Great. Yes. Okay. So, um, yes, what I'd like to jibber jabber about today, um, and, and I'm going to interrupt from time to time and ask for questions um, because um, I, I'd love to make this um, interactive, um, is uh, I'd like to talk about like giving you a little bit of a, a peek behind the curtain at Journal of Management. So, you know, I think Typically, when we we're talking to a, a doctoral consortium, we'll say, all right, how do I publish in the top journals? And but I think you get a lot of that um, from various sources. And so what I wanted to talk today about is how do we make decisions at JOM? What does that process look like? Um, and, and what is the reviewing process? Look? A lot of the things that you, you can't really see as an author. Um, you know, dealing with decisions is part of this job. It's, it's unbelievably awesome when you, when you get one of these publications. I remember when I was in, 
in your situation, actually a little earlier, when I first showed up at Texas A&M, uh, it was our first year and we're sitting around with the faculty and they're you know, telling us how important research is. And Adrian Colella says, publications are the currency of the realm. That really stuck with me. And Travis Serto, in the same faculty meeting, he came around and said, these, these publications are like little gold chips. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's very rewarding when we get them. And it's nice to be in a job when we, when we can have something like that to work toward. But man, is it ever frustrating. <laughs> um, because more often than not, your papers are not going to be accepted. And, uh, and so I remember Don Hamburg talking about this at a conference one time. And somebody asked him how the heck he's so successful. And he said, you could wallpaper my office with rejection letters. <laughs> and so that's part of the business as well. Um, it really can get depressing, but over time, I, you know, I think you, you can really reach a Zen when you learn how to deal with rejections in ways that are constructive um, and try to avoid the, what do they call that on the OB side? Uh, so what, what, what's the thing where you, where you when you win, it's like, because I'm so awesome, but when you lose, it's like, oh, it's like the reviewer's fault. Like the self-serving bias, maybe? Fundamental <laughs> attribution error. Fundamental attribution error. It's one of those, something like that. So you're trying to avoid that, right? So that you can recognize your own uh, mistakes and get better. Um, some of the things that, that we see, um, <coughs> J-O-M, in terms of desk rejections, that's the first hurdle you're trying to get over. Is, is making sure you're not desk rejected. Papers that just aren't relevant to the discipline of management. Um, you know, if it's, if it's in another, if it's in finance or accounting even, you know, uh, you have to, I've heard it this way. It's like you're walking into a party and there's all these little groups that are talking to each other and you got to find your group. You've got to start a conversation with people that are already conversing. If you just kind of walk in that room and say, hear ye, hear ye, you know, I've got some, now let's talk about something completely different, right? Nobody's going to listen, right? And so you're trying to join a conversation. Improper formatting, and I'm talking about, I'm using the word formatting very broadly here because it's not just font size, right? You know, this is about your citation strategy. This is about the structure of your paper. You know, reviewers, they're trying to make decisions about the quality of your paper, but if you make it hard on them by not following the format that they expect and that they're used to, now it makes their job that much harder. They don't know where to turn, they don't know where to look. But if you've got all the hooks hanging in the right place, then they can start asking the questions of how good is this thing that's hanging up. Uh, if it's hanging in the wrong place or, you know, if you've structured things in the wrong way, they're not going to know how to evaluate your paper. Uh, if you've got just the same old, same old, right? <laughs> um, you know, you, you've got a paper, it looks like a JOM paper, but these hypotheses could have been from 20 years ago, um, then, uh, then you're not going to make it past the desk rejection process. And at JOM, uh, I do an initial round. I read every paper that comes into JOM. So, you know, I'm reading like 1,400 papers a year. Um, and on the macro side, I, I'm pretty good with this. So I, I, I can tell, you know, you know I, I kind of know what, what's old and what's not for the most part. On the micro side, I'm not very well equipped for that. But um, I have three senior editors. Uh, on the micro side, it's Chad Van Eideking. The macro is Zeki Simsek, and then the methods papers is Chris Byron. Um, and so uh, on the micro side, Chad is very good with this, right? And so, if, so it might get by me, but Chad will look at it and say, oh, wait a second, you know, we were, we were looking at this in, in the 1980s. Um, insufficient design. So here I'm talking about, you know, let me generalize this a little. I think sometimes there's this attitude of, Okay, well, we've got something now. Let's just kind of put it out there and see if we get an R&R, &R, right? Uh, that is a bad strategy. You're not going to get an R&R. &R. <laughs> really, you need to, not just with design, but in the paper in Toto, you need to do everything you can before you submit. 
Um, if you're just kind of putting things out there and crossing your fingers and hoping for the best, that's not a good, that's not going to work. Um, and then in particular with designs, you know, if you're, if you're, if you've got a design that's just, you know, a, a small number of students or, um, you know, a cross-sectional analysis, you know, that's never going to fly. You want to, you want, you want to design your paper with a view toward something that when reviewers get it, they'll say that they'll, they'll say, this is fantastic, right? Um, poor data again so this is this has to do with you know your sample a lot of times I'll get small samples and it's not even qualitative you know it's just it's just a set of students or something like that and then we do get most of our papers are from North America but we do get some uh, well a lot of papers from from other countries and I think a big mistake we get here is folks that do the same thing that's already been done but they do it in a different country and say oh, okay well now you know so here, you know, you know all this, but it's true in China as well. And that's not gonna, that's not gonna go anywhere. Uh, and lastly is, well, I don't know that I needed this bullet, but it, you know, if you got this article, it looks like a JLM article, right? You're, the structure is in place and, uh, and, and the methods are there, uh, but you just know this thing's not gonna get through the review process, um, then it's not likely to be uh, to go under review. Um, I guess, I guess this article is kind of redundant because it's probably one of the bullets that came before. Um, for initial decisions, we're looking at the desk rejections or, I mean, you, you start to look at this thing and it's like 60% desk rejections, 30% rejections, and pretty much everything's rejected. <laughs> so I, can, I suppose it can be kind of discouraging, but, um, if you turn this on its head a little bit, uh, you can kind of look at it this way and say, look, you guys, and I use, I'm from, from New Jersey, so I use guys to mean everybody, um, but guys and gals, right? So you guys are, you know, you're trained at really good institutions, uh, and so you know how to prepare a pretty good paper. So if you can put the effort in at the, the outset to, and you feel like, you know, this is a pretty good paper. Maybe you've got one of your mentors or faculty members on it who have published before. Um, then you're you're likely to get past this desk rejection. So then you're just looking at the rest of the pie, and then you can say, "Oh, wait a second here. I've got about a one in four chance of getting an R and R." Uh, and so then it, this whole pie starts to to look a little bit better when you think about it that way. Um, there's no there's no reject and resubmit at the uh, at JOM. So you really, you get one shot at this, uh, which raises other questions too of, you know, what, what does it take to be a new submission? Um, and really it's, yeah, you need new data and new theory. You know, you, you need a whole new paper. Um, if you change one of those, it, it's not a new submission. And then at the R and R stage, here's where you're trying to get to is an R and R. Everything changes when you get to an R and R. In fact, uh, you know, the, the folks at Auburn know I've got this whiteboard here and, and it's, uh, I put my projects up there. I've got early stage, late stage, and under review. And that's on the top of the whiteboard. And then there's this dotted line and underneath is R&R, second R&R, and third R&R. Everything is aimed at trying to get below the dotted line uh, because everything changes then. You know, first of all, as you can see from this chart, your probabilities completely change, right? If you get an R&R, it's, it's a foot in the door. You never want to let an, a revision opportunity go because your probabilities just skyrocket. You know, now you've got a, over a 50% chance of, of this thing moving forward. So R&Rs are critical um, and that's why they're so important. But the other thing, there's like a hidden reason why R&Rs are so important. And that is, you know, before you, you submit a paper, when you're above that dotted line, a paper can go any direction. There's anything you can do with it. You know, it's just, it, and, and authors could have different ideas. Data could take you in different directions. Um, you know, you can slice the paper in different ways. I mean, there's just so many directions you can go. And then you get that R&R &R and boom, now you know, you've got a path for your paper, right? You know exactly what needs to be done to get this through to publication. So you, it's a completely different mindset once you've got an R&R &R, and it's a completely different task. Um, and then on the second revision, uh, if you, you get a second R&R, &R, 
you know, majority of those are accepted. Um, you know, we, we're not going to give you a second R and R unless we think your paper is going to move forward. Not all of them are. You know, I've, uh, this fifteen percent. It seems like a small number, but I've been there many times. <laughs> I've been there at AMJ. I've been there at JOM. It's painful to get a second R and R rejected, but it does happen. Um, and then sometimes you need a, you know, a final, you know, uh, one more round of revisions. But generally by a second r, &R we want to make our decision. I'm going to pause there for a second before I move on to uh, reviewing. Um, are, there, are there any questions so far that anything, or anything you want to chat about yet? Brian, I'll make a comment and ask a question. So these days I'm reading a book by Mike Weisbeck, uh, a JFE, uh, a JF uh, editor who's at Ohio State. Yeah. And he says the first, the desk rejection rate at, uh, QJ, at QJE, uh, which is the premier economics journal is 50%. So yeah. your, your slide said the desk reject rate at JOM is 60%. Is that yeah. common in management or is that JOM? No, that's pretty common. It was about that at, at AM, AMJ as well. Uh, AMJ was, it was just under 50% when uh, Jason Shaw started and just over when he finished. So, um, and, you know, ours is running at, you know, around 60%. It was actually a little bit less than that, but submissions have been way up since uh, I and my team started, which is actually the reverse of what usually happens. Usually when there's a new team, submissions come down. That happens every time with AMJ is that the prior team gets a slew of submissions and then the new team comes in and people don't want to submit to a new team because uh, it turns out new editors are more critical. You get less critical as you, uh, uh, as you age in, the, in that particular job. Um, and, but, uh, but, you know, I think the uh, the review team, the editorial team that came in at JOM was just very very high quality um, and and a, and a bit heavier on the strategy side, and so I think that really kind of fostered so fostered submissions. So submissions were up thirty percent um, from the this time last year. So uh, um, that might contribute to the initial desk rejection rate. Thank you. Any other thoughts? All right, um, let me talk, oh, uh, this is one other thing on decisions is our turnaround time. Uh, the days from submission to decision, I put five there for desk rejection. Um, it's actually not even that, it's closer to one, really. I mean, I, I'm a, I, I log in, I'm looking at papers uh, every day, really twice a day. Um, and so a lot of times paper will come in and I'll desk reject it right away. And, but I don't typically send those out right away because I don't want somebody to be desk rejected in two hours. So, so, uh, so I'll, I'll typically wait for one day anyway to desk reject. Um, um, so, you know, that's very fast. Now for original submissions and revisions, we're looking at a couple of months. Um, you know, this this is not terribly important to me. I, I, I'd like to keep it around a couple of months, but if this turns into two and a half months, it's not, uh, that's not my primary objective. I want great decisions. Um, there are some things that are important, are important to me. Uh, you know, one was the quality of editors that we have. You look at our uh, editorial team and oh my gosh, they're just, every one of them is five star. Uh, another is the quality of their decision letters um, and the quality of the editorial review board. And we've had a, like a 30% turnover where we just, we got a lot of new people on our editorial review board board and they're, and they're, they're people that are publishing. Um, and so, you know, those things are important to me. Turnaround time, uh, you know, I, I want us, you know, I don't want this to turn into triple digits in terms of days, but uh, but it's not my primary objective. Uh, in terms of reviewing, uh, every, oh, so this is interesting. So I, every author is a reviewer. When authors submit a manuscript, 
to uh, to Manuscript Central, to JOM at Manuscript Central. They sign up to serve as an ad hoc reviewer. I was reviewing these slides, I was looking over these slides yesterday, and I realized this is entirely untrue. <laughs> I put it in here like a week or two ago in preparation for this event, and I just realized it's not true at all. I thought it was, but it turns out when you submit, when you initially sign up as an author, you're just an author. You have to somehow choose to be a reviewer. So that's something I got to look into because there's a whole bunch of people that are authors but not reviewers in in Manuscript Central. So anyway, that's important. <laughs> um, when you sign up to be a reviewer, the keywords you use are really important. You want to use a lot of keywords because at your stage, now if you're a doctoral student, you're not reviewing for JOM unless you're a senior doctoral student, uh, maybe with a publication or, or an r and at a top journal on a particular time. There are occasions when I would ask like a maybe a fourth year doctoral student to do an R&R. &R. So that happens um, and that's fine. Uh, but if it's a topic that you published on or, you know, that you're very comfortable with. Um, but you want to, uh, you want to pay a, t a lot of attention to those keywords because the editors are looking at the keywords to choose reviewers. Um, and here's some of the things that you uh, get empirical uh, grades within your reviews that you never see. Um, all you see is the qualitative aspect of reviewers, but you're getting scores on your papers, getting a score on interestingness, clarity of exposition, methodological rigor, implications for practice. And now you, you get a score on your contrib <clears throat> contribution to length too. Because somebody emailed me last week and said, hey, I've got a 20 page paper and one hypothesis. Can I send that to JOM? I said, yeah, you know, that would be great. We don't, I mean, JOM is historically known for 50 page papers, maybe a little bit longer than some other uh, uh, peer journals, um, but I'd be pleased to entertain a shorter paper with, with a great contribution oh, and fit with JOM. All your reviews, by the way, are reviewed by the editor. You get a score for every review that you submit. So be careful because these stick with you for life, right? So, um, and then you get, uh, and you know, an aggregate score. So eventually you're gonna say, oh, you know, I'd like to be on the editorial review board and we'll look at, okay, well, what's your aggregate score? And it'll be, you know, 2.3 or 2.7. Uh, and if that's too low, then you're not gonna be invited onto the editorial review board. Or later, you know, you want to be an associate editor, for example, um, your reviews, need, your scores need to be quite high to be an associate editor. If you're a reviewer, you want to, you want to be very timely. You, you want to submit your review in 27 days. Um, and again here, these stick with you for life. So and you get an average turnaround time that, uh, that you know, is going to be with you forever. So if you're, if you have 90 days on a, on a review, it's going to be hard to pull that back to an average turnaround time of under 30 days. Um, you want to review the, the total paper, both front end and back end because your score will depend largely on the extent to which you address the whole paper. Uh, and it, it's important too to have some depth of insight to your reviews. If you're missing some of the key aspects of the paper and then other reviewers identify those problems, that's not gonna look good for you. Um, the editor is not gonna like that. So the way to get the best score is to really think about these things. Um, write the review you'd like to receive. Uh, these reviews are typically scathing. Uh, the, the tenor in reviews on average is terrible. In fact, when I write reviews, I write my review, the last thing I do is get a quick read through just with tenor in mind. And invariably, I change like three or four things that changes the complexion of, you know, of, the, of the review. I always open with positive comments. Uh, and uh, the editor, I always open my decision letters with positive comments. So the editor is looking for those positive comments. So you should start your reviews with positive comments. Um, and if you're going to identify a problem, I recommend trying to identify a potential solution, but offering some conditions on it, you know, one possible solution. Those are the best reviews um, is because you want with solutions, 
you want to allow the reviewers to follow your solutions or not. If they find other ways to address your problem, that's fine as well. Uh, and number and, and have your and consolidate your points and prioritize them by importance. Don't just walk through the paper from beginning to end. Have four, five, six points where you, you, know, you put everything within that point and the most important point is first, the next most is second, so that the reviewers know and the editor knows where to attend uh, their mo the most information. Don't copy edit a paper. Um, we have professional copy editors. If the, if the paper is going to get, get accepted, it's going to, uh, you know, the copy editors will take care of grammar and that sort of thing. Um, don't suggest a decision to authors. Don't say I'm gonna, oh, you should reject or revise this. I mean, to I should say to the editor. Um, just you know, just give your assessment of the paper. But it's not your job as a reviewer to give a decision. Uh, be positive in the don't don't do the, don't be positive in the comments, but then recommend rejection. That puts the editor in a terrible situation. Uh, so you want to be consistent in your recommendation to the editor and in what you're actually saying to the authors. You don't want to demand that the authors write the paper that you would write. The, it's the author's paper. Let them, let them go and take it in the direction they want. Uh, but then, you know, if that, you might write a different paper, but you're, you're assessing the contribution of the paper that these folks are writing. Um, Let's skip through the reviewing fact because I want to talk about responding to uh, reviewers. Is that and uh, Vishal, I'm wrapping it up here in just a minute. Is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, let me do this. Let me just cover this very quickly. Is when if you get an R and R, be conversational in the in the revision. I I and don't be defensive. I respond to everything in the reviewer comments. I respond to everything in the sub comments. So if I get a, a comment from a reviewer and it has four sentences, I'm responding to every one of them, not individually, but you know, after they respond, then I come back and I respond with it to everything that they said. And, uh, and I'm not defensive about it. You know, I, I will be uh, explicit about where to look for the changes in the paper. Um, and I'll explain how to how the change addresses the problem that they raised. A lot of times I'll try to repeat it back in their own words. And they, because if they're reading their own words in a different way, it's like, oh, oh they got it. Yeah, yeah excellent. You know, uh, there's probably another OB concept there, right? Where you create some kind of uh, affinity because they, they, they say they identify with what you're saying. Oh, these people really understand. Um, I think being forthright is really important. Um, you know, admit your mistakes. You know, I think that's probably, people that are not successful in R&Rs, that's probably their biggest weakness is that they, they'll choose to respond to certain things and choose not to respond to other things. Uh, but I feel like, and you're gonna get different opinions of this from various faculty and that's fine. My, in my view, the best approach is to respond to everything. Now in any set of reviews, there might be one or two things where they just misunderstood or you, you disagree um, and that's all right, you know, but you've got to address it. Don't just overlook that. You say, here's what you've asked us to do. That's a really good point. But you know, another way of looking at it is, or the reason that we think we shouldn't do that is, uh, because I feel like when we respond, I've heard it said this way, um, Mickey Catchmore says, once you get a set of reviews, it's no longer your paper. It's a team project. I thought that was, imp that was insightful. That I think the body of science is going to advance further when we admit that the review team as a collective knows better than any one author. Um, so that's why I'm so as responsive as I am. And if I disagree, I'm going to explain why I disagree. I'm going to do that very carefully. Uh, let me choose those battles carefully. I will stop there and, and Vishal, if there's any questions, I can keep talking or answer questions or if you need to move on, that's fine. Glenn, we'll ask people if they have any questions, they can ask, uh, otherwise we'll move on if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. We'll take one question in the interest of time. I 
have a question. So someone who used to work at Ole Miss, their, their, um, their approach to responding to reviewers was to kill them with data. So their response to reviewers would be 100 pages long almost, like 50 to 100 pages. They would give them all this information, tons and tons of data, and essentially drown them in information. Do you recommend this approach? Hmm. You know, uh, it kind of depends how you do that. Um, I would not recommend doing that in the paper. Um, in the terms of the responses, uh, I think you have an extra measure of freedom there uh, to throw some tables at the end. Uh, I do that sometimes with alternative operationalizations. Um, if you know, if uh, usually I'll have an operationalization, or a lot of times with various control variables, it's good, very good for that, um, where you're using a set of control variables in the paper. Um, you might have a set of supplementary analyses, but there's arguments against uh, including too many control variables. Uh, so if they ask for things in the, uh, in the reviews, a lot of times I'll just say, look, we, we ran it that way and those variables were not significant or, or they were significant. Um, and, uh, and I'll include them as an appendix in the responses to reviewers. Oh, shoot. I have to answer this call, Vishal, so it might be a good time to stop. I'm sorry. Perfect. No, that we are, uh, we are on time anyway. So thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate this. We have three methods primers. Each of the three presenters we have will have 15 minutes, uh, and you, can, you should feel free to ask questions. We start with Dr. Miles Zachary of Auburn on content analysis. Miles? Uh, thank you, Vishal. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, good. I got my ear, I got my, my AirPods in and I, I never know if it sounds good. Um, thanks, Vishal, for the, uh, the opportunity to talk about this. Um, some of you have probably seen me talking about content analysis, analysis before, uh, perhaps at Academy. Um, I've done, I've been a, participant in the Academy of Management's uh, PDW on content analysis for golly, uh, nine or 10 years now. Um, and then I've, I, I know that I've been to Mississippi State uh, and seen you guys at Mississippi State. I, I recognize a few of you here. Um, so good to see you again. Uh, some of that's going to be a little bit repetitive if, if you were at the Mississippi State, uh, which I, I think there were a couple of Ole Miss folks that came to. Um, some of that will be a little bit repetitive, but I'm going to try to introduce some new things. And I'm going to keep it really short. Um, just because uh, 15 minutes is not long and I can be long-winded. So let me share my screen with you guys. Um, Vishal, can you, um, do you mind allowing me to share my screen? All right, so in kind of tongue-in-cheek fashion, I titled my presentation a few words about content analysis. Uh, for those that don't know, content analysis is all about trying to understand uh, text and what people say or what organizations say. It's got a really broad definition, and I, I like the, the broadness of the definition because it's very inclusive. There's lots of things that we can kind of file underneath this broad definition. Uh, so the definition uh, that I like is any methodological measurement applied to text or other symbolic materials, like that could be like pictures or videos um, for social science purposes. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a very inclusive definition. And so what falls under this could be qualitative or quantitative. Um, it could be deductive where we, where we know what we're looking for and we go looking for it. Um, or it could be inductive uh, where we don't really know what we're looking for, but we're gonna just kind of let the text speak to us. Um, now the important thing about content analysis is no matter whether it's qualitative or quantitative or deductive or inductive, it needs to follow some kind of systematic approach. Um, it needs, and, and the reason it needs to do that is because just like any other science, we've gotta be, uh, the, the findings um, need to be reliable and potentially um, able to be replicated. And so following that systematic procedure helps us avoid bias and also means that, you know, we can rely on the findings that we, that we, we come up with. So um, a couple of things about content analysis. Um, it, the methodology itself is really predicated on this notion that language is important and it's important um, so much so that it can be linked to how we think about things and our social relationships and how we engage in those social relationships. Um, and that's really good because it allows us to take what people say or what organizations say and use that to understand and quantify the constructs that we care about. You know, 
I've just listed a few here, but things like cognitions or schemas, right? Uh, dominant logics or strategic frames, if we're talking about like an organizational perspective or even institutions. Um, and so the belief that language is important is really kind of, it's, it's implicit in the methodology, but it's very important. Now, um, over the years, I've, I've noticed some myths about content analysis that seem to kind of come up every now and then, particularly at the Academy of Management. Um, one of the first myths that I came across is that content analysis is easy. In fact, um, I remember having some conversations with some, some doctoral students when I was a doctoral student um, who, you know, would say things like, oh, well, that's just a content analysis study. That's easy. You basically like cooking your own data. And it's like, yeah, that's not exactly true. Um, the difficulty of content analysis is very much determined by the researcher. I've seen studies where, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's probably not the, the most rigorous study in the world, but then I've also seen some content analysis studies that would completely blow you away in terms of the rigor. And, and that's really all up to the researcher. And, you know, obviously the more rigorous the content analysis, the more um, interesting, or well, not interesting, but perhaps at least a more reliable um, the, the findings are going to be. And so, you know, of the, of the articles that are published using content analysis, which I'm a reviewer on a lot of these papers. So if you submit something, you know, Brian had mentioned JOM, uh, you know, if you submit something to JOM, uh, I'm an editorial board member there, you know, you're going to get me, you're going to get Aaron McKinney. Um, there's a number of other people that you're going to get. And so I've reviewed a lot of these things and, and, and it's, uh, it's definitely not easy to get them through. Content analysis is universally applicable, all right? Uh, I think we all, at some point in our careers, um, you know, we discover that hammer, right? And so then everything is a nail, right? And so we start trying to use that hammer everywhere. Um, and content analysis is super flexible, but it's definitely not meant to understand everything. Um, it really, you need to, to, to think about what's the phenomenon and what are the constructs that you're trying to measure within the phenomenon or attached to the phenomenon, and can you do that through rhetoric, okay? That's a really important kind of thought process that you need to walk yourself through. Um, otherwise, it might not be something that you can use content analysis for. Um, uh, let's see, the, the, the third myth is that content analysis studies are difficult to publish. I know I just said that they're not easy to publish, but they're not impossible. Um, I don't think that they're any more or less difficult to publish than, uh, you know, uh, a study that uses some other methodology. Um, you know, you, you have to defend what you did. You have to be able to defend it well. You have to show that it fits the phenomenon and the construct. Um, you know, I think that the thing that I've noticed about public, you know, people trying to publish content analysis studies is that um, a lot of times um, where they run into trouble is, they're trying to measure something that really can't or shouldn't be measured with language. But otherwise, content analysis is, uh, is, is no more difficult than some other, you know, a study with some other kind of methodology. All right, so why would you use content analysis? Well, um, there's a number of, uh, of advantages. First, um, it helps, uh, content analysis gives you a cool angle with which to study lots of different phenomena different levels, right? And, and, and constructs at different levels. So looking at things at the individual level or maybe the team's level, um, uh, certainly at the organizational level, you can even look beyond that. It's really, it kind of depends on the level of analysis of the documents themselves. And, and that makes it a very flexible uh, uh, methodology. It's also analytically flexible. And so, you know, you could look at manifest content. These are things like, like what's actually said in terms of words and phrases and, you know, um, in fact, a lot of the, the, the package software out there um, can, can quantify all sorts of narrative and rhetorical uh, content. So you could look at that, or you could look at the latent content, right? The things that are being said through the words, right? So themes, um, it's, it's, it's very, very analytically flexible. And then the other thing that I really like about content analysis is that it gives you access to rich, or rather you can um, use rich longitudinal data after the fact. And so that helps to avoid those common recall biases. You know, if you're, if you're doing a study that, um, you know, you're asking people, let's say in interviews or using surveys, like, you know, how did you feel or what did you think about this? I mean, naturally there's gonna be some recall bias uh, perhaps some social desirability biases that are going to affect the results. Whereas if you can take what somebody said in the moment after the fact, then you can avoid that. 
Uh, oh, and last, it can, it's also much less uh, obtrusive um, when it's applied to archival text than something like a survey or an interview, right? Um, where you might be introducing um, or kind of affecting what people are going to say based on how you ask the question or the fact that you're asking them a question at all. So what do you need to get started? Um, well, the first thing you need some software, probably you don't actually have to have software. You could use uh, just, just a highlighter, right? I mean, qualitative content analysis, the way they used to do it, you know, 20 years ago before there were so there was software for this is you know, sit down with different color highlighters and just try to, you know, you assign a, a, a theme or, you know, something to each highlighter. And then, you, you, you know, you, get, you read through and, and highlight certain words or phrases that you felt like reflected the theme associated with that highlighter. Um, but now we do pretty much everything with software. Now there's a lot of prepackaged software out there. Uh, some of these may sound familiar to you. You may be, have even used them before. Uh, Diction, that's probably the, I think that's probably the one that I started with first. Um, that's a great software. It's a little bit expensive, um, but if you're doing anything related to politics or you know, political language, that's a great one to use. Uh, LIWC is another one that's really common. You might've even heard it referred to as Luke. Um, and Luke or LIWC is really great at looking at um, kind of emotional or affective content. It's got some built-in dictionaries that are great for that. Um, more than just positive and negative, um, they've got a lot of other kind of sub-dimensions with uh, underneath underneath the positive and negative affect that, that are, are really useful and it's super reliable. People have published using these uh, or people have published studies in management using Luke and so it's very reliable. Um, WordStat's one that I haven't used um, a lot because it's pretty expensive and the last time I used it, it was really cumbersome. Now that may have changed. That was probably seven or eight years ago. Uh, lots changed since then. Um, but that one uh, is, is pretty popular, uh, especially on the qualitative side. Now the one that I would point you to to start with is Cat Scanner. Cat Scanner was developed by a buddy of mine, Aaron McKinney, who's now at Indiana. Uh, this is a free program you can get on right now you can google cat scanner content analysis and you can download this and start playing around with it um, and so that one's great and then if you're doing any kind of qualitative research you might look into indivo or max qda you can also develop your own programs in r and python um, that's what i've been doing a lot of lately is just building my own in r mainly because i'm wanting to do some kind of pre-processing procedures with the text that you can't do with the out of the box prepackaged software, you know, moving things around, cleaning the data, that kind of thing. And then there's just a lot of tools that have been developed through R that go beyond what a lot of the out of the box software can do. But of course, you might want to brush up on your R or Python skills uh, if you're gonna do that. It's not, it's not crazy, it's not too hard. Believe me, if I can do it, you can do it. But it, it definitely takes a little bit more investment of time. You also need text, right? Um, you need a corpus of text, which is just uh, is a word we use for a collection of texts. Um, examples of collections of text might be like shareholder letters or website content. Um, it could be interview transcripts. Um, I've also uh, analyzed open-ended comments from surveys. Uh, that's a great that's a great place to insert kind of another way of measuring something. So you could maybe use scales um, to, to to measure a construct, but then also you know, ask them a question that leads them to a response that you could then content analyze those open-ended responses that might complement the results that come from the scale. Um, I've seen that a lot. I, I think that's a really great design. Um, the way you want to store these things is typically through either a CSV file, so, you know, in the different cells or as a text file, like a .txt. Um, my recommendation is to avoid any kind of rich text formats if possible, because there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of behind the scenes uh, data that uh, sometimes messes with some of these softwares and might affect your results. So you know, go simple. Make sure you choose your your, your corpus wisely. Um, this is what's going to determine whether your findings are valid or not, right? So make sure that you are measuring things at the right level of analysis and that um, the data is, is is free of garbage and it's and it's and and the 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 corpus itself or the documents that are in the corpus are coming from a, a place that you feel like the construct that you're trying to measure could actually be measured from, right? So what type of content analysis are you gonna use? Um, well, let's start with um, you, right? Let's say you are gonna be doing the coding. So do you know what you're looking for? 
Um, if you don't know what you're looking for, then you're, you're wanting to look up something called thematic analysis, all right? So if you're interested in hand coding a set of documents, but you don't know what you're looking for, you want, you're kind of, um, you want the documents to speak for themselves, then Google thematic analysis, okay? I don't know much about that, so please don't ask me any questions about it. Uh, if you do know what you're looking for, well, then now you're talking manual content analysis. And this is where you could use some software like InVivo or MaxQDA to kind of help you keep track of the things that you are looking for as you're going through these uh, different documents. Now, doing this yourself is definitely inexpensive um, and it does give you a lot of control, but it's super time consuming because you have to read everything. It's also potentially inaccurate. Um, and you might be biasing your results just based on the fact that you're looking at this data, you're looking at these, these narratives through your own personal lens. And you might miss something where somebody else might, you know, they might highlight something that you didn't highlight or you highlighted something that they wouldn't have highlighted. And so, you know, there's just some, some natural biases associated with doing it yourself. So now let's think maybe we could use the computer, okay? Um, if you're using the computer, you get the same questions. Um, the first question though, before we get to the, do you know what you're looking for or not is how comfortable are you at programming? Cause if you're really comfortable with programming, there's some amazing natural language processing, uh, packages out there that you can use in R or in Diva, excuse me, R or, um, Python. But if you're like most of us and you're not super comfortable with programming, um, you might think about going in a different direction. Um, like some of the prepackaged softwares that I talked about. Now, do you know what you're looking for? If you don't know what you're looking for, so you're wanting the text to speak for itself, check into topic modeling. You've, you've probably seen some papers that have been published recently uh, using topic modeling. It's becoming much more popular in management research. But if you do know what you're looking for, uh, you need to again ask yourself, do you mind programming? Because if you don't mind programming, Supervised machine learning is really, really neat. You're basically training the computer to look for things. That way you're not relying on a dictionary, but instead you're letting the computer make decisions about what, what's being said in the document. Um, but if you don't wanna do any kind of programming and you just wanna sort of feed the data into the machine, tell it what you're looking for and have it spit some numbers out at you, now you're talking about dictionary-based content analysis. You know, I was just going to show you a couple, on, and this is really more um, to, you know, this will be available, I'm sure, uh, uh, for you guys if you want. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there's a lot of resources out there. I, I've, I've listed a, a bunch of different publications um, that I would recommend everybody taking a look at. And then the last thing I want to draw your attention to is uh, the University of Georgia hosts, hosts a website uh, for, uh, that's related to the PDW at Academy of Management for Content Analysis. It is awesome, okay? So if you just Google UGA content analysis, you will find this website that they're hosting for us and it's got everything. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you, Miles. And we'll move on to our next speaker, which is Dr. Quinn Swanquist of Alabama on propensity score matching. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me uh, get my screen up here. All right, hopefully you're looking at what I'm looking at now. Uh, I'm Quinn Swanquist. I am a uh, faculty at uh, the University of Alabama. I'm in the accounting department. So uh, many of you guys uh, you know, probably don't know me. In fact, I, I think I maybe only know one person in the audience and that's Neil, he's in my class right now. Uh, I'll give him a quick shout out. And so he'll probably be able to sympathize with this a little bit. Um, sometimes it's tough for me to do things in a very short order, right? So I'm gonna try to do this in 15 minutes, okay? Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, uh, Vishal, please please jump in and stop me if, if, I, if I'm going too far, too far, okay? Or I'm going too long. So, um, so I'll start out by talking a little bit about how I kind of approach uh, research questions. Um, and because I think that's helpful in, in, in thinking about, you know, how uh, we might want to use something like propensity score matching to help us with our research, answer research questions and things like this, okay? So um, whenever we're trying, you know, often as researchers, right? I mean, I know a lot of you guys, particularly as PhD students, 
um, uh, out there are, are, are starting new studies or you're, you're, reading, you're reading current studies and, and trying to come up with your own research ideas. A lot of the research that you guys will be doing, a lot of the research that, 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 uh, that we do, uh, relates to trying to estimate a causal effect. Right, and so I know sometimes we're trying to be careful about using that term, right? Trying to be too strong about the causal inferences that we draw from our studies, um, but oftentimes the, the the interesting component of what uh, you know we're trying to convey in our study has something to do with it with a causal connection between two things, right? So, uh, so we often find ourselves trying to estimate treatment effects, right? We find ourselves estimating treatment effects, and so um, we, we, you know we might want to know the answer to several research questions. So, you know, I'll start out with kind of two textbook ones. You know, does smoking result in negative health outcomes, right? Uh, does education improve earnings? Okay, so for those of you guys who have taken maybe some stats or econometrics courses, you may have used those examples in like textbooks and things like that, okay? Um, I'll, I, I mentioned I'm in accounting, so um, I'll, I'll give you an example of something that we might do. Uh, we might wanna know if large accounting firms or auditing firms are better at their jobs than, uh, than, the, than, than smaller ones, maybe they perform better audits and they they uh um uh they they, they certify um financial statements that uh that are higher quality or maybe we want to know if they charge higher fees okay we want to charge know if they charge higher fees um you know if you're in another setting you know i know many of you guys are in uh in a um uh, looking at different things, management settings and things like this. Uh, you might look at a corporate governance question like do anti-takeover provisions, you know, affect firm performance or uh, does a, a CEO or top management pay uh, affect some kind of outcome, right? And when you're asking those questions, you really want to know the answer. Yeah, you want to know a, a causal connection, right? You want to know, you want to know the uh, causal connection. Now, it's not always so easy to do, because oftentimes we're doing these things in, in observational studies. So my talk today is going to be mostly related to those of you who are doing some kind of like archival type research where you're not necessarily controlling or manipulating the setting. Um, uh, you're, you're, you're getting historical data uh, that, you know, that, that, that uh, you didn't assign uh, treatments or values to and, and, and you're, you're, you're trying to see if you can use that to uncover, to, to uncover a causal effect. So uh, one of the first things that, uh, that I think we learn um, as, as PhD students is that, you know, uh, we can try to estimate these effects using like a, a regression or, or OLS, right? So um, I, I, as I go through this, I'm going to kind of stay pretty high level. Um, you know, this is, uh, I'm trying to gear this towards say, you know, well, really anybody that's interested in this research uh, or that's interested in doing research from first year PhD student all the way to experienced faculty member. So most of you guys should be familiar with this. Don't spend a lot of time here. But in an observational study, right, the treatments, let's just say the companies that get a big four firm, it's not random, right? So the companies that choose a big four firm, these are companies that are probably larger, maybe more sophisticated, and they're likely to have uh, maybe pay higher audit fees anyway. And so if you're trying to figure out if a big four firm charges higher audit fees, you're going to have to deal with some of this non-random assignment, right? So a simple regression, we would just say, okay, well, let's see what the effect of some treatment on some outcome is, okay? Um, and if we're in an observational setting, you know, someone's going to quickly point out that we have maybe some selection bias, that uh, the, the, the treatment that we're looking at is... Um, is not causally related to, to the outcome, okay? So the first thing that we kind of, that we learn to do is we say, well, if we can try to measure these differences between the treatment and control, so I'll stick with my example of a big four firm, big four large audit firm and large audit fee and high audit fees, because it's something I think that most people can relate to. Uh, someone might criticize uh, a, a, a sort of a, a basic difference in means type test by saying, well, the clients of the big accounting firms are larger. And so, you know, you might wanna control for that, right? And so uh, we can augment or add um, uh, variables to our regression model to try to tease out some of these differences, right? So um, we try to add extra X variables to try to um, uh, control for these things, okay? So this is kind of the typical regression framework. And the reason I start here when I'm talking about propensity score matching is because this is kind of where I started learning about how we deal with confounding factors, right? Um, and then I'm going to sort of shift in a second to what propensity score matching does maybe a little bit better than these settings and, and also kind of what it doesn't do, okay? 
Um, Brian mentioned earlier uh, something I think is probably many of you may have caught it in passing, um, but but made a, uh, an excellent point about um, these variables that we try to control for. Um, we want to be careful about the variables that we select. In some cases, we can actually control for too many things. And so uh, the framework that I usually use to try to think about what kind of things do we want to control for uh, looks something like this. And so, you know, I might ask myself, um, I, I want to know if more treatment, more of something, affects, causes more of why, right? So did bigger auditors cause higher audit fees? Does uh, smoking cause negative outcomes, right? And so what you want to control for are things that are predetermined to both of those things, but maybe also have sort of a downstream effect or, or uh, are, are downstream of, of both the treatment and, and the outcome. So, so what do I mean by that? So um, what we're saying here is that we want to control for things that might be related to the treatment or cause the treatment or predetermined to the treatment, but are also related to the outcomes, okay? Um, like the, the arrows that we have represented here are very important. So uh, my example of company size would fit this bill, right? So if T was a, was a large auditor and Y was how much fees are charged or something, okay? Uh, X, uh, a good X variable, the control variable would be something like company size. Okay? Company size determines what kind of auditor you pick. Company size would also determine the audit fees that you're charged, okay? Um, Okay, so uh, once you've developed your model and you've got your control variables uh, all specified, um, a, a skeptical reviewer might ask you, did you properly specify the linear relation between all these variables right? uh, or the variables in the outcome? So uh, maybe I used a, a company size variable and I've got a company complexity variable and all these different things in, in, my, in my controls. And um, someone says, uh, you know, I think you've got the wrong functional form. And I don't know what the right functional form is, but I think yours is wrong, okay? So one way to alleviate that is to match, right? Uh, to identify pairs of treatment and control observations that have similar characteristics. Similar, I'm calling these X, similar characteristics. Uh, using a matching technique. So for example, like propensity score matching, which I'm gonna jump to in just a second. Perhaps the more common criticism that you're going to get, and so, so some of you guys who've gotten some of those, those mean review reports like Brian was mentioning, right? Um, you might have uh, gotten something that says, you know, hey, you don't have, you've missed this omitted variable, or you've missed this, uh, this potential alternative explanation. You have no, no measurement for it, right? There's no, uh, no representation of this issue in your model, okay? So this would be something like, uh, an unobservable problem, omitted variables bias. Sometimes you call it just generically like endogeneity or something like this, okay? Now here, you have to use uh, techniques that are outside the scope of what I'm gonna talk about today. But the reason I bring this up is that I think sometimes there's a misconception that PSM or matching techniques will take care of things that you don't see, okay? Um, that's only true if the things that we don't see are captured by the things that we do see. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Okay, so uh, matching methods are um, particularly propensity score matching. Uh, you guys have probably seen it being used a lot more. And I know in accounting research, I can speak to this, right? In accounting research over say the past 10 years or something, the use of propensity score matching has grown quite a lot, right? Um, uh, I guess across all disciplines, uh, King and Nielsen will, will uh, cite that there's been 141,000 studies that cite something or, or discuss the use of, or, or at least discuss something about propensity score matching. So it's, it's becoming quite um, universally used, okay? So what is it? So propensity score matching is an intuitive way for us to compare those treatment observations to a similar set of control observations without necessarily having to match on every dimension that you want to control for simultaneously, okay? So, so in practice, what you're going to try to do is you're going to say, let's see if I can predict being treated, like predict companies that have large auditors, um, and come up with a probability for each observation, each company, as to how likely they are to be treated, and then match on that probability, okay? With the hope, the goal, that you can kind of balance uh, all these different drivers of being treated, okay? So PSM allows us to, it's, it's, it's a simple matching approach, 
but it has some adva the advantage over traditional matching approaches of just matching on several different control variables or, or dimensions is that you you might not have uh, enough perfect matches, right? So in other words, we can kind of allow two matches to be maybe be different on some, dim uh, some dimensions, but have the same propensity score, okay? And we hope that in aggregate, we get something that works pretty well. Uh, so specifically, treatment and control observations are matched based on the predicted probability of treatment, okay? Now this is a uh, probably if, if if I end up running out of time, this is one of the one of the things I want to make sure that that that's uh, that, that I convey. So relative to the re earlier regression approaches I was mentioning earlier, right? Um, PSM. Oh, the last minute, just yeah, oh, one minute. Okay, okay. Wow. All right. Uh, so relative to uh, regression approaches, okay, PSM alleviates concerns with respect to functional form misspecification. So you don't have to make sure that you've that you've actually uh, properly specified the relation between a control variable and an outcome. Okay. Um, it also forces you to control, uh, to consider what predicts the treatment, okay? So in that sense, um, it will help you identify controls that are possibly good controls. Um, and then I am gonna finish this, this is my last slide, okay? So uh, my last point here. So, um, so, those, so the benefits, right, are that um, you can relax one of the assumptions that you're using in your, in your regression, that, that you had the proper functional form, that you've, that you've properly specified your control variables, okay? Um, but what it does not do for you, okay, so something to kind of be aware of is that, well, similar to traditional regression, propensity score matching doesn't address any kind of uh, uh, generic concern related to things that you don't observe, like omitted variable bias, okay? So in that sense, it's not a substitute for instrumental variables approaches and other things that uh, you may be familiar with. Um, it requires many design choices that need to be disclosed. Do I match with replacement? Do I match one to many? So on and so forth. Uh, if you're interested in more of those details, actually, uh, I have a couple of papers that are listed uh, here for you to check out. One is my own in the accounting review uh, that summarizes the use of propensity score matching in my stream of research, but I think some of the issues that we've identified are similar in other, uh, or um, uh, translate to other areas as well. Um, and there's another paper in the Jur uh, Journal of Accounting Research um, uh, Minus 2011 that does a very good job of describing kind of how you should use it in a practical setting. Okay. So I think I still went a couple minutes over, but I did my best. Thanks, Quinn. So, yeah, and thank you. Can you share the slide deck with the, with the audience through Zoom? Uh, would, you be, would you be willing to share the slides? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Thank you. And sure. uh, I'll share with the audience a paper from Journal of Management where we use propensity score matching because we were inspired by your work in this area. Uh, okay, so cool. I'll share with the audience. But in the meantime, I'll call on Dr. Jeremy Muser from uh, University of Mississippi to talk sure. about uh, graphic network analysis. Jeremy? Yes. I Four am yours now. sharing El Screeno here. <clears throat> okay, what the hell is going on? There we go. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so you should see that now when I shared the slides. Hi, everyone. Jeremy Muser here. And I'm going to talk to you about network analysis. And notice I said it's a very brief overview because any aspect of what I'm going to talk about, we could talk about for an entire hour. And we don't have an hour. So we will let the content collapse to fit the time allotted. So network analysis is a broad concept. It's used all over the place. It's used in mathematics. It's even used in philosophy. It's used in logic. It's used in computer science. Google's PageRank algorithm is totally a networks thing. Sociologists use it to, to track populations. Um, virologists use it, or and it's it's all kinds all over the place. Ecologists use this. It is very versatile, but one of the challenges is that network analysis, much like uh, um, Miles's presentation, just like CA, content analysis, can mean a lot of things, network analysis can mean a lot of things. So, networks. One of the powerful things about it is you could draw really pretty pictures. 
And the, so I've just went out to the internet and I found some pictures here. So consider that the, uh, consider that the one in the left and the upper left with the green and the purple and the red, this could be a picture of uh, work groups within the company. And you can kind of see like the red cluster in, uh, at like 10 o'clock. Maybe that's one location led by, let me turn on the, uh, the pointer, pointer, laser pointer. So this thing right here, this is a company or, or a division or a department led by this person who talks frequently with the supervisor over here, who manages all of these people. And some of these people have some assistants. Do you see? Or maybe these are interns. And the, uh, this also could be things like classes at universities, where these people are students, these ones that are bound, what's called boundary spanners, uh, these are the ones that might be the instructors or the professors. And these are the ones that never come to class. You see, so can mean lots of things. This one over here, uh, this could be a model of, of different companies where what we have here is the blue could be a manufacturing company. The red is the client company for which the blue company is performing the manufacturing. And the yellow could be some kind of vendor industry co-partner that works with these people. And these people could just be a supplier that sells stuff to this people. And unbeknownst to them, they're also selling some stuff to these people over here. And so, and then this thing right here, this just could be an, uh, a graph of leadership influence. I'm a leadership person, so leadership's my hammer. I hit everything with a leadership hammer. So you can draw these pretty pictures. You can draw these pictures about a lot of things. This could be, uh, this could be uh, how birds interact. This could be how, uh, how virus people are transmitting viruses. It could be all kinds of things. So there's three major, in my head, there's three major types of network analyses, one of which is called social network analyses. And these answer questions like, to whom do I go for, for advice or information or socialization? Who has influence? Uh, who do I listen to? It's this kind of thing. You can also track the spread of information or, for example, COVID-19 over time. The next category are networks of ideas. And so this could deal with what types of ideas or topics or constructs or measures tend to coexist in articles or what kinds of words coexist. And so this deals with, uh, with Miles Zachary's uh, text analysis. And you can in fact use uh, text analysis or content analysis and network analysis together. Perhaps you've seen things like word clouds. Word clouds are essentially uh, gra making graphic using a network style analysis, what uh, comes out of your content analysis. Then you can also look at things like networks of papers. This is a category is generally called bibliographic analysis. And these deal with things like co-authors or co-citations. So this is really often more about met the metadata of the paper this would deal more with the content of what's in the paper or in the text or in the corpus. And this is generally used to look at, uh, at, at people uh, or, and the, the way you collect the data is radically different. So features of network analyses, there's things called nodes. Nodes are the dots. The nodes have size, they have color, and these can be, you can ascribe value to these things. So for example, the larger a node is, it could mean the, uh, the longer someone is in, uh, in the company. Lines are the connections between the nodes. So the existence of a connection can communicate information. The thickness of that line and the color of that line can communicate information. 
The lines can have arrows, which can communicate information. And this is called in degree versus out degree. So if the line is pointing away from me, that's out degree. If it's pointing to me, that's in degree. Then the real, in my head, not only is the real power of network analysis that you can communicate all of this information in one picture, but then a lot of those things could also be communicated using a Excel chart. This when it gets to closeness, where you're seeing node A and B and C connected with their, with their relative sizes and then their relative positions. The positioning of the nodes and the clustering of the nodes communicates something that in my head just cannot be communicated with an Excel chart. I don't think I can see it with the Excel chart. And so to me, this is where the real juiciness of the network's uh, comes into play. And also you can look at density. So for example, here you see that this is more dense than say this. Because you get all these little nodes right in here, all these little nodes coming together. And density can communicate information. So for example, thinking about social network analysis, one of the things that we're concerned about in the study of leadership and people at work is to whom do you go to for advice? Because sometimes you go to the supervisor for advice and sometimes you go to the secretary or the person who's been there a while or the person that, that you knew before you joined or the person who sits next to you or the person that was in your, uh, your socialization cohort. There's a whole bunch of reasons why we're connected to people and seek out advice from them. And one of the big flaws of the leadership literature is that we study leaders almost exclusively as the formal supervisor, the one in the formal position of power. And we sort of ignore all the other influence that's going on in the, in the organization. And people that study social network analysis are expanding our appreciation of the impact of influence and networks and these informal leadershipy kinds of things. So that's in my head the real vis-a-vis -vis leadership, the real power and the real interesting thing of social network analysis. So for example, the nodes could be people. The node size could indicate org tenure. Or it could communicate the amount of advice that they receive or the amount of advice that they give or the relative amount of advice that they give and receive. L lines are, are the connections and the, the thickness could in indicate the amount of advice that's going one way or the other. The in degree could be when, uh, when uh, people are coming to me for advice. The out degree is when I'm going to someone else for advice. And then we've got uh, closeness. And so when we've got the closeness of these nodes coming together, these people coming together, you can visually see the clusters of the people coming together and how the and who's who's hanging out together and where the advice clusters are, if that makes sense. And that can also show information bottlenecks. So if you've got a cluster over here and you got a cluster over here and you got one person in the middle, that's a, that's a bottleneck. And so you could even use this type of thing to evaluate in your social, uh, a social community, in your society, in your, in your work group, in your organization, in your location. All right, so where's the communication breakdowns between A, B, and C? So centrality is another big question, and I'm going to kind of punt on this a little bit. How much time do I have left, Vishal? I didn't look. You have two minutes left. Thank you. So I'm going to punt on this. Just to suffice it to say, centrality is a big question. So um, again, there's three types of analyses, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples. The first one is Crobot Mason Gerbasi and, and Kristen Cullen Lester, who is on this call. Uh, and so sorry if I botch your, your paper, Kristen. So this looks at networks of leadership ties and square nodes that represent individuals. So these are the formal leaders and these are the informal leaders. And you can see just from what's going on here, the long story short is that uh, the, uh, the informal leaders 
Uh, my big takeaway is look at how many circles are right here in the center. Wow. These informal leaders, these people right here, they're wielding a lot of juice in this network. Now, the next thing here is networks of ideas. And so what I, in, in a paper that I did with some colleagues in 2016, and what we see here in the middle is this is, these are leadership papers that have three or more constructs in them. And uh, we, if you see right here, papers that are about charismatic leadership often basically don't talk about transactional all that much. So there's this whole school of charismatic uh, leadership that's different than transactional. And these charismatic people are really kind of interested in, in followership and relational and attributional theories. And so you can kind of see that this is sort of the core cluster of what's going on in the, in the way that charismatic uh, uh, leadership researchers are talking about their juice. Now, over here, transformational, and a lot of people equate transformational as charismatic. We can see now that when the paper is about transformational, it's they also talk about charismatic and there's all this leadership in teams and leadership and followership, leader and follower cognitions. And so it's a different way of, the, these scholars have a different way of viewing the network. And the other thing we see is that while transformational LMX are studied quite a lot, almost roughly equivalently probably in the literature, look at how way less sparse this is. And so even though it studied a whole hell of a lot, this analysis shows that LMX it, people are kind of over here doing their own thing even more so than other leadership uh, scholars and their ideas. Yeah, now, when it yeah, comes to network of ideas, take a look at Zhao and Li because um, they show that there's different clusters of these, of these, of these ideas. And they got their data using a, uh, a um, machine learning process. Networks of authors. So you can see the big names in the literature and how they cluster together. And if you look in the paper, you will see that these people kind of do LMX and these people do their thing and these people do their thing a little bit. And so this chart compared in, with the 2016 paper shows us Oh yeah, not only do the do the, the papers themselves kind of talk about their own little way of viewing the literature, they also work together in their in their own little networks. The yeah, last yeah. one I want to show you here is the networks of citations. And yeah. Yeah. this shows us that information moves from physics to chemistry to biology to ecology. To, uh, to pharmacology and medicine, to neuroscience, to psychology, over here to applied psychology. And that's the corpus of science. I think that's pretty fascinating. You have here a list of softwares that I recommend that you, uh, that you take a look at if you're interested in doing this. That's in the slides. Uh, I have experience playing around with Voss Viewer and Cytoscape. My advice is Foss Viewer is generally better than Sitescape, but sometimes Sitespace has a, a tool that Voss Viewer doesn't have. And uh, Sitespace is harder if you're using the Scopus database. If you're doing networks of papers, I recommend Scopus over World of Science. And then other resources are here. Uh, I, I recommend if you've got questions about social network analysis that you talk to Kristen Cullen Lester, Networks of Ideas, feel free to talk to me and Miles Zachary if you're interested in combining that with CA. And then Networks of Papers, my academic brother Hao Zhao uh, did the paper on 20, uh, in 2019 LQ, so he's, and he's a nice guy. And of course Google, because there are, unlike some of the CA stuff that can cost a lot of money, most of these resources, in my experience, are free. I, uh, so thank you very much. I can take questions later. And I also want to make a plug. If you're interested in leadership, make sure to join the Network of Leadership Scholars. Yay. Thank you very much.
Okay, so hello everyone. I am Sarah Davis. I'm a third year doctoral student here at Mississippi State and my primary research is in the transgenerational succession process in family firms. So today what I'm going to present you all is a book chapter that I've been working on and I'm going to try and keep it pretty high level. So if you want to chat about this later, I'd be happy to talk to you guys. So to begin, you guys might be thinking, hmm, what exactly is transgenerational succession? Why does it matter? Why are you interested in it? And I think that's a good question because if you don't study family businesses, you might not see why this is an important topic. So if, if we think about the words transgenerational succession kind of separately, we have succession, which is this process of passing from one to the next. And then transgenerational means that it comes from one generation to the next generation. So we're passing something along. And in the family business literature, the things that we're looking at are two. So we have the transfer of management, so passing management from one generation to the next, but we're also passing control from one generation to the next. And you may still be thinking, well, how is this much different than what we study in non-family businesses? Because in non-family businesses, there's also a transfer of management. You know, a CEO steps down and another steps up. You, there's also the transfer of control. There's um, stocks, there are mergers and acquisitions, all of these sorts of things. So what is it about family business succession that's so interesting? And that is the, the presence of family influence. So in everything that the business does, there is this family presence. When they pass management on or when they transfer control, the family plays a critical part in this process. So transgenerational succession is typically looked at as a process rather than a singular event. So this process is comprised of three different phases. The first phase is uh, rules and plans. And in this phase, potential successors are identified and plans and ground rules are established. The second phase is development and selection. And in this phase, um, the identification of a potential successor, uh, they look to train these potential successors, develop them, and then eventually towards the end of this phase, they actually select a successor. And then finally, the third phase is the transition. So in this phase, the incumbent starts to step aside and the successor steps up, takes control and management of the family firm. So all of this is well and good, and this process is often looked at. Um, it's a, a big part of family business literature, and it's usually looked at how does this succession process impact firm level outcomes. So maybe it's firm performance, maybe it's stakeholder satisfaction, things along those, those lines. But in all family business literature, there has been a call to really explore the micro foundations. And micro foundations are theoretically informed explanation of how firm level outcomes, such as firm performance, emerge from the characteristics, behaviors, and interactions of individuals. And these micro foundations are especially interesting, or at least for me, for um, the research in the family business succession, because if you think about it, the succession is really about two people. So you have an incumbent, you have a successor, and how do those people play a part in this whole process that has these firm level outcomes? So to kind of dive into these micro foundations, uh, I started looking at some psychological perspectives. And to be specific, um, we looked at five different psychological perspectives. So the first one is evolutionary psychology, and this is based on Darwin's theory of evolution. So this uses the concepts of selection and gene preservation to help understand behavior. Uh, next, we looked at cognitive psychology, which is the study of how information is obtained and how it's used to make decisions. Uh, the third is developmental psychology, which focuses on understanding why and how people adapt, how they change, and how they grow during their whole life. Uh, next was social psychology, which is the study of how behaviors and intentions of other people influence an individual's cognitions, emotions, and behaviors. And then finally, industrial organization, or as you guys probably better know it, IO Psych, uh, which aims to understand human behavior for the purpose of enhancing employee well-being, also organizational performance. 
So we took these, we took these five psychological perspectives and thought about how they could be used to help inform research that's being done on the succession process. So to do so, we kind of began with the, with the first phase, which is the rules and plans, and said that evolutionary psychology could be used to help answer some questions such as how succession rules and plans are formed, uh, why some firms go through a competitive process to choose a successor, while others will pick an heir based on their gender or their birth order. Uh, then we looked at cognitive psychology and so that it could be used to inform questions uh, pertaining to the cognitions around the incumbent's desire for transgenerational succession and also the successor's willingness to join the family firm and also to uh, look at the process used to launch and manage the entire succession process. So how do you develop those rules and those plans? Next, we looked at phase two and thought that developmental psychology could be used to help develop some insights into the antecedents to the succession process, especially those critical parent-child relationships. So if you think about transgenerational succession, I, it typically looks like a parent passing their business onto their child. So how do those formative relationships impact this business process later on? And also how cooperation and role acceptance and risk orientation and things of that nature influence the successor's development. We also felt like social psychology would be an interesting perspective in this phase and could help answer questions about how behaviors and intentions of the incumbent, other family members, um, even consultants, how they could be used to influence the successor, both their cognitions and emotions. And then also how politics within the, the family members that are in control of the firm, how they could be used to determine the successor and who is selected. Are they selected based on competence or is it something like they're the firstborn? And then finally, we have the third phase, which is the transition. And we felt like the um, psychological perspective of IO Psych was most appropriate for looking at uh, research questions pertaining to this phase. Um, questions such as how cognitions, emotion, and behaviors of non-family managers can influence this process. So not just family members, but also non-family members. And how the transition phase could influence family brand and reputation, both internal and external to the organization. So I know this is a very quick overview, um, and this is really only a portion of the book chapter, but uh, one of the interesting parts was where we paired up these psychological perspectives, and this kind of gives you an overview of each phase and which psychological perspectives we think could really help to develop the micro foundations of the uh, transgenerational succession process. So if you all have any questions, I'll stop sharing my screen so that I can see you guys. Feel free to ask questions. If not, we'll move to the next speaker, which is David Keating of University of Mississippi. And we already, I already uh, made him co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. David, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm just making sure my right, I have multiple screens. I want to make sure the right one goes to you guys. Are you seeing just the presentation, not my timer? Okay, great. Uh, so my name is David Keating. I am a first year at Ole Miss. I'm presenting a research project that we're just starting to collect data on. It's pride, guilt, or hubris. Supervisors' emotional responses to high maintenance employees. Um, so, what if I told you that 80% of a manager's time is spent with 20% of their employees? These individuals are known as high maintenance employees. High maintenance employees are employees that are seldom satisfied. They're high strong. They seem to have constant urgent needs. They exist in <laughs> perpetual drama. 
uh, grumble about hot, their unmet needs and their higher uh, than normal expectations. Perhaps most importantly, they demand a larger than the necessary amount of a manager's time, resources, and attention. I'm from Pittsburgh, so uh, uh, Le'Veon Bell is a great representation of this to me. Uh, so that's why those pictures are there. So what happens though, uh, when a supervisor can't take it anymore? In this study, I respond to calls for causes of negative behavior in the workplace. Um, I also try to create a consensus of the high maintenance employee construct uh, by combining work of pop culture as well as academia. Uh, and I offer a new model that explains the role of emotions and the relationships between supervisors and high maintenance employees. Uh, my theoretical development for the paper is a combination of effective events theory and Lazarus's cognitive, motivational, and relational theory. Effective events theory, very overarching, says that employees have effective responses to workplace events, uh, which have emotional consequences and influence employee behavior. Uh, while it, Effective events theory provides this overarching model. Uh, it doesn't give us much predictive, abil uh, predictive ability for specific emotions and behaviors that we should expect to see. For that, we bring in the cognitive motivational relational theory. That says that individuals experience external stimuli, they enter into an appraisal process, they, which results in emotions, and that each emotion has a specific action tendency that we can use to predict how individuals behave. So the Conceptual, conceptual diagram and hypothesis development begins with the supervisor interacting with the high maintenance employee. Uh, I say that this can result in two things, uh, negative behaviors or positive, well, the supervisor can respond in two ways, with negative behaviors or positive behaviors. Negative behaviors are, in, I expect to see incivility. Imagine this is kind of the supervisor basically giving the employee a taste of their own medicine. Uh, a positive response I expect to see would be supervisor supportive behavior. This may include things such as the supervisor giving the employee extra time or telling the employee how much they value uh, all the extra work they're doing, um, which would mean a lot to the employee as someone that thinks that they're not getting enough value in the company. Um, so effective events theory posits that when a supervisor isn't uncivil toward an employee, they will have an effective response. Uh, we can ex extend that with the work of Lazarus uh, that proposes that we can predict a specific emotion via how that supervisor appraises the behavior. Uh, for incivility, uh, if a supervisor appraises the behavior as inappropriate, they may feel bad about how they interacted with the employee considered against how they should be acting as a manager. Uh, I therefore expect to, there to be a positive relationship between incivility and guilt. Um, but what about when the supervisor doesn't feel bad and perhaps feels good about what they did? Uh, perhaps this supervisor feels like she, like her behavior was justified or that she put the employee in her place. Uh, due to the potential for such excessive pride, I predict that they will also be a positive relationship between incivility and hubris. Uh, on the other hand, if the supervisor engages in supportive behavior, uh, the supervisor may feel that they did the right thing, that they engaged in behaviors that are expected of managers. Uh, I therefore expect there to be a positive relationship between supportive behavior and pride. Um, Lazarus's theory further predicts that each emotion, emotion has predictive capabilities in the form of action tendencies. Uh, for hubris, the action tendency is to engage in expansiveness seeking behavior. Um, a supervisor experiencing hubris therefore should seek to extend those feelings that led to the hubris. Uh, so they may continue or even increase their incivility towards the uh, high maintenance employee, leading to long-term interpersonal problems. I uh, therefore expect to find a positive relationship between hubris and interpersonal and further interpersonal problems. Um, the action tendencies for guilt, on the other hand, are to atone or make reparation for. So a supervisor that feels guilty about the way they responded to the to, with incivility to the high maintenance employee uh, may seek to make amends. Uh, such as engaging behaviors like providing extra positive feedback or coaching behaviors. Um, I therefore expect there to be a positive relationship between guilt and supervisor mentoring. Uh, finally, just as hubris, pride also has that expansiveness seeking behavior as an action tendency. But for this supervisor, instead of experiencing pride due to inc incivility, which may be inappropriate, 
This supervisor is experiencing pride due to their supportive behavior. So they should seek to continue that kind of relationship by mentoring the employee further, which would give them additional feelings of pride. Um, so due to this, I expect there to also be a positive relationship between pride and supervisor mentoring. Uh, so there's the full theoretical framework. Um, the current state, status of the project is that we're collecting data on two scales. One is for perceptions of a high maintenance employee. Uh, it's for where the supervisor is measuring individual employees about how they perceive that employee to be high maintenance. The other is a response-based pride scale. Previous scales for pride are very, they use individual words for self-report. Um, with hubris, uh, which has been found to be a separate factor, so there's a two-factor model of pride with hubris, because those words are narcissistic and uh, egoist and things like that, it's not very likely that we're going to see very much self-report. So this new uh, scale that we're developing or I'm developing in includes items like I feel like I'm on top of the world. Or, I feel like I'm top dog. Things that people may actually respond that we that still fall onto the two factors of pride and hubris. Uh, the next steps will be a three a three-way multi-source field study at large in, or large organizations. We're going to collect data from the focal supervisor, the focal employee, and the supervisor's manager uh, at different time points. We'll get, we'll get the IVs at time one, the mediators at time two, and the DBs at time three. Um, and then we've been in communication. The one area that needs a little thought is whether we need to describe or I need to describe more um, why the supervisor engages in negative or positive behavior with the high maintenance employee, not just that there is going to be a tendency for both. So one of the areas where that may be possible is through a lab study. Um, theoretical implications are that this is, advances our knowledge of the causes of deviant behavior in the workplace. Uh, it's consensus creating, as, as Hollenbeck says, is, is a value to the field. Um, advances research of self-conscious emotions and provides new scales. Um, and then for practice, it also provides businesses with a better understanding of a common but little understood employee type, high maintenance employees. There's been books about it. There has been lots of pop culture of, uh, uh, information written, published on it. Uh, but there really is very little academic research on it. Uh, and that's about it. So I, uh, I could take, I stayed under eight minutes. <laughs> I could take any comments or questions. Another question. Um, are you going to be looking at any kind of performance metrics for the high maintenance employee as to how that may moderate wow. if the supervisor uh, reacts one way or the other way? So if it's a good performing employee, even though they're high maintenance, would you react differently? Follow up again, please. So that is an actually a really good question and good point that I'm going to mark down. The one interesting thing that previous research has proposed, and uh, there's been a book about it, is that a high maintenance boy can be bad or good. So that's why I did that Le'Veon Bell example, which doesn't hit on everybody. But Le'Veon Bell was one of the best running backs in the NFL. Uh, but he was a drama queen. Um, so that can be one case. On the other case, you can have a, an employee that is incredibly needy, that is just like, I can't complete my work unless you like overlook it, or I need the supervisor to sign off on every like form I fill out. And that could be a lower performing employee. So it, it's more about the time and resources that they take up of the supervisor than about their quality of work. But I think including something like what you're saying as something to control for and to look at uh, is, is a very good insight. Thank you. Thank you, David. And with that, we'll move on to uh, Neil from Alabama. Uh, hello everyone. I am Neil. Uh, I am a second year PhD student at the University of uh, Alabama. I'm in management department. 
Today I'm trying to present uh, one of my research ideas, which is a uh, peak of analysis of relationship between entrepreneurial orientation and firm performance. So uh, feel free to drop in. It's just an idea which, uh, uh, which is still on, under works. So I would, I would definitely appreciate all the help that I can get from you. And at the same time, kindly critique me and kindly pose as many questions as you can. So uh, for those who are not aware of what I'm presenting, uh, so EO or entrepreneurial orientation uh, is, it can be basically understood as a strategy uh, that firms employ to uh, basically take entrepreneurial decisions. So uh, the relationship between EO and firm performance is one of the highly, most highly studied uh, relationships in, in entrepreneurship domain. And uh, it is found that most of the theory, empirical evidence, and meta-analysis, they kind of suggest that there is a positive relationship between EO and firm performance. So, uh, but at the same time, we have found that there are several researchers who have raised concerns that probably this relationship might actually not exist and it is very contextual in nature. And at the same time, there are some concerns regarding that probably it may be a result of some kind of confirmation bias because initial studies had published uh, this uh, positive relationship in a, to a much larger extent. And we are finding new studies now who have uh, posed uh, that this relationship may not be very positive that we, we have tend to uh, be uh, got to believe till so far. So we scrutinized this debate uh, using our newly evolved method, which is generally known as P-curve analysis. And uh, what we are trying to do basically here is we are trying to understand whether the reporting that has been there in the field uh, is not a selective reporting. So. Okay, yeah. So uh, what is peak of analysis? So peak of analysis is basically, uh, just, just a second, let me think if I missed a slide. Okay, yeah, good. So uh, researchers, they tend to report all these studies that work. We have always uh, found that uh, it is very difficult to report a study uh, which has got non-significant findings. And so uh, it is, it is, it is known to many people that p-hacking might be a matter of concern for the field uh, where uh, researchers may tend to publish data, uh, sorry, use their data in a way that uh, they can find significant results uh, in the favor of what they are trying to find. So uh, the question arises whether these effects which they have found uh, after doing the research, are they true or they are merely selective reporting? So Simonson, Nelson, and Simons, uh, in 2014, they came up with this idea of peak of analysis, and uh, they had two aspects to it. They kind of uh, talked about significance testing, and they also talked about evidential value of the studies which are reported. So uh, they conducted a big simulation, and they found out that in case if there is any, an absence of effect, or what we say that there is no effect in this in a, of our two uh, of a relationship, so the p-values which we will be getting uh, will be related in a way that p-value less than 0.05 will occur 5% of time, p-value less than 0.04 will occur at a 4% of time. And basically it's going to be uniform. And in case if there is an effect, and then if we are trying to find out these effects through the empirical analysis, we will find that p-values should be less than 0.025, uh, if at all, if the, that relationship is really existing in the data. And if they are not, then we can find that uh, there is some kind of p-hacking that might be going on and there will be high number of values in our uh, data, which will be representing, which will be representing uh, values between 0 0.025 and 0 0.05. So uh, what method did we use and what did we do in this uh, experiment is, white Chaudhary and Gupta uh, 2020 paper, it talks about that uh, there are 551 articles which are empirical in nature and they uh, use firm level EO to make their analysis. So from these 551 articles, uh, what I did is I went on to examine how many of these papers, they study the relationship between EO and firm performance. So, uh, when we talk about peak of analysis, uh, the, the first paper, the initial paper talks about creating a set of rules before making an analysis like this. 
So we created a set of rules. So the set of rules included that we identified that researchers should have a stated hypothesis where they are testing a direct relationship between EO and firm performance. And at the same time, we also made sure that they have taken in consideration only the aggregated EO as a measure and not individual level EOs or not individual EO measures. So uh, we, when we found out uh, there, there are a number of people who are testing the stated hypothesis and they had this EO aggregated as well, but at the same time, there was one thing missing and that was that they had not stated their P values. So if those, if those papers which were there, which hadn't set to the p-values, we had to remove them from our study. Uh, also, there was a particular ambiguity of selection regarding which EO measures, because aggregated EO can be also measured by multiple ways. So we chose Scovin and Slevin measure uh, for, uh, this, uh, for this selection. Once we had found out all these studies from those 551 studies, we, we picked the p-values and we created the p-curve. So P curve helped us to identify uh, the, the, the significance, tested that, significance testing that was done in these experiments. And at the same time, the empirical, uh, the, the value, the, sorry. Uh, just a second. Yeah, the evidential value. Okay, so there were, there were two, two rules to selection. So when we had selected here, the, the Coven and Slevin, uh, after that, there were like two things that we did. So the first one was using a st strict rule or the conservative rule. So in the conservative rule, we found that there were a total 11 studies that qualified. And of these 11 studies, there were uh, the 10 of them, which stated a p-value, which was from 0 0.01 and 0 0.02. And there was only one study that was from 0 0.04 and 0 0.05. So that led to a right skewed uh, curve that we can see over here. And we can find that uh, there is a lot of evidential value. And it states that, uh, that the relationship that we are trying to e evaluate, that, is, that relationship is actually positive. Similarly, what we did is we relaxed this rule of selection with some other EO measures as well. And then we, st we were able to find 21 studies. And of those 21 studies, we found that that one study was still there at the same time, the shift was slightly on the right side now and we could find some more uh, evidence of, of p-values from 0 .0, uh, from 0 0.03 to 0 0.04. So these values, they stated that uh, some, so far there, there is slightly some kind of uh, evidence that this relationship can be justified, this relationship can be existing in the, in, in the field but at the same time, that led to several questions. Uh, sorry. At the same time, we can find that there were several questions which can be up for discussion by seeing those curves. And those questions were uh, that even though there is a positive relationship, however, there may be uh, issues regarding to the performance that has been measured. So most of the people who have been measuring this relationship between EU and firm performance, they have use a different performance measurement uh, matrix. And if we, can, uh, if we can standardize them, if we can find out that there can be a particular measure of performance, that could help us to uh, say for sure that there is a positive relationship between EO and firm performance. But the evidence that we received from that, we can say, yeah, that there is an existing study, but at the same time, it opened room for discussion regarding, uh, as I said, the performance measurement issues. And at the same time, uh, we, it was also found that EO components can be correlated to performance measure, but uh, there may be some of them who may not be. So they, that may lead to a decline in performance uh, and therefore that relationship between EO and firm performance may be somewhat dicey uh, to evaluate. At the same time, there is one more thing is uh, whenever we are studying these relationships, most of these firms, they are leaving firms and therefore it may have happened that those firms which may have high performance, high EO values, they might have ended up failing. So what about them? So the, the, there is still room for uh, more discussion on this particular topic, but so far the evidence that we had received, which we had seen in the papers, that suggests that yeah, the positive relationship between EO and for performance, it does exist. So from here, I will stop and I would open room for any comments or questions.
Neil, we are about we are out of time, so uh, we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, which is uh, Te Wu Kim from Mississippi State. Te yes. Wu, do you have? Are you there? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Can I share my slide now? Okay. Let me try for it. All right. Can you see my slide now? Okay. All right. Um, hi, all. Uh, this is Tay from Mississippi State University. Uh, today, I'm going to present one of my study that I'm working with Dr. Sexton and Dr. Mahler, uh, titled Innovation as a Mixed Gamble in Family Firms, the Moderating Effects of Interorganizational Cooperation. Uh, and this is the contents of this presentation. And since it's gonna be a short presentation, I will briefly and quickly go over each of these contents. Um, before I get to the research model, I'd like to briefly talk about research background of this study. Um, the innovation of family firms has long been a research objective in the family firm literature. However, the findings of the impact of family ownership on the family firm's innovation is still largely mixed. So uh, to shed light on the family firm innovativeness, this study focuses on the understudied boundary condition that may affect uh, family firm innovation, which is an interorganizational cooperation. And according to the extended literature, uh, interorganizational cooperation involves uh, socially contrived mechanisms for collective action, which are continually shaped and restructured by actions and symbolic interpretations of the parties involved. However, the factors influencing the cooperative innovation of family firms are, are still understudied. So uh, to bridge this gap in the literature, this study aims to explain how uh, interorganizational cooperation influences family firms' willingness to innovate. And as a main theoretical framework, this study adapts mixed gamble approach, which is a refinement of social emotional wealth perspective that captures the fact that most strategic decisions uh, involve the possibilities of both gains and loses. And this is the research model of this project. And let me briefly elaborate uh, each of these hypotheses on the research model. Uh, first, uh, we hypothesize that there is a negative relationship between family ownership and firm's willingness to innovate. Um, based on the idea that family firms put weights on the preserving SDW, which is a uh, social emotional wealth, we argue that there is a negative relationship between family ownership and firm's willingness to innovate. Uh, it is because, you know, uh, risk and uncertainty inherent in the innovation are highly likely to harm their SCW, like uh, transgenerational succession. So despite of the possibilities that the, the family firms will get some kinds of gains through the innovation, uh, we argue that family firms are less likely to be willing to innovate because of their intentions, intentions to preserve SCW. And along with the hypothesis of this direct relationship, we also hypothesize the moderating effects of interorganizational cooperation. Uh, in particular, we hypothesize that um, interorganizational cooperation mitigates the negative relationship between family ownership and firms' willingness to innovate. Uh, when family firms per, uh, participate in uh, interorganizational cooperation, the potential gains in uh, terms of SCW and or financial outcomes uh, in the family firms' mixed gamble on innovation are gonna be enhanced, whereas the certain loses in SCW are gonna be weakened. 
Um, since uh, family firms may take a chance when they perceive uh, greater, greater potential gains than uh, potential loses associated with the gamble, uh, we contend that the in, uh, that interorganizational cooperation is likely to uh, in encourage family firms to pursue innovation. However, um, as you can easily imagine, the aspects or the nature or the impacts of uh, interorganizational cooperation are not determined by cooperation itself but by the type of cooperation, cooperative partners and the type of cooperative activities. So uh, we hypothesize that the moderating effects of interorganizational inter cooperation may vary uh, depending on the cooperative partners and cooperative activities. Uh, in particular, based on the idea that non-commercial organizations like um, universities or um, government institutions are less likely to be involved in opportunistic behaviors and more likely to be restricted by the laws. We hypothesize that the moderating effect of, I mean, the moderating effect is stronger in the case of cooperation with the uh, non-commercial organizations. So in other words, the reluctance of family owners to innovate will be mitigated when they cooperate with non-commercial organizations. Uh, similarly, uh, we, we theorize that the moderating effect of interorganizational cooperation is stronger when family firms cooperate with, I mean, cooperate for the research-oriented activities, uh, such as investing in a new product development, than when they cooperate for the non-research-oriented non activities like you know sharing distribution networks or joint employee joint employee educations because uh, research oriented research oriented cooperation is more likely to lead to um, successful innovation outcomes when compared to uh, non-research oriented cooperation so um, to test this hypothesis we adapted the data uh, conducted survey data conducted from Korea Ministry of Small and Medium Enterprises and Startup and Korea Venture Business Association. And the sampling number of the survey in each year is about 2000 and this study adapted the survey conducted in 2017. And the exact number of the sample was about 2114. And um, the willingness to innovate, which is a DV of the study, is measured by R&D expenditure. And family ownership, which is an independent variable of the study, was measured by the percentage of the share, a percentage of the share owned by founders and the family members. So basically, both DV and IVs are the continuous variables. And for the moderator variables. Uh, I have, I mean, we have used the survey question on the slide. So basically the moderate, moderated variables were dichotomic, dichotomous variable. And according, I mean, following the extended literature, uh, we have controlled family size, uh, firm age, and industry, and the location. And to uh, test this hypothesis, we have used uh, two different analyses, uh, which are OLS regression and the pro process macro approach in SPSS. So, it, so uh, specifically to test a hypothesis, which, which is a direct relationship, we have used uh, OLS regression. And to test hypothesis two, three, four, which is a moderate moderation model, we have used process macro approach in SPSS. And let's, let me talk, uh, let me show the results of the, the analysis. Uh, this is a descriptive statistics and the correlations of all, all the variables in the research model. And this table shows the, the results of all the analysis for this uh, research, for the research model. 
Um, first, as the result of model two shows, hypothesis one is strongly supported. So basically, there is a, so basically the result shows that there is a negative relationship between family ownership and the willingness to innovate, which is aligned with the previous uh, findings. And similarly, as the result of model three shows, hypothesis two is also strongly supported. So basically, interorganizational cooperation mitigates the negative relationship between family ownership and the willingness to innovate. Moreover, uh, the result of model four and five support hypothesis three because, as you can see here, the moderating effect is significant only in the case of cooperation with non-commercial organizations. And lastly, um, as a result of uh, model six and model seven shows, uh, hypothesis four is not supported because uh, because the moderating effect of cooperation is significant regardless of the cooperation uh, activity type. So uh, based on these findings, uh, this, this study contributes to the literature in several ways. First, it deepens our understanding of when family firms uh, interorganizational cooperation is likely to lead to a family firm's innovation by considering types of different types of you know cooperative partners and cooperative activities, and it also contributes to our knowledge regarding the heterogeneity of family firm innovation. And lastly, this study also examines the influence of non-family ownership on family on the firm innovation in a non-Western context by using Korean uh, small business data set. Evo, we'll have to stop here. We are out of time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Can I stop sharing the slides so that I can see everyone? Say that again? Can I stop sharing my slides so that I can see everyone? Yes, please do. And uh, the next speaker is Jacob Weddingham from Auburn. So Jacob, whenever you're ready. Uh, Jacob, are you there? Jacob? If not, Paul? Paul Solanilis? Are you there, Paul? Yes, sir. Oh, Jacob? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Sorry about that. Perfect, Jacob. It's 454, so you'll have 10 minutes. All right, got it. Awesome. All right, so you guys can see my PowerPoint slide here, okay? Awesome. Yep. All right, so my presentation today um, is going to be on video introductions to online surveys and if they are a blessing or a curse for creative and illogical responses. All right, so first off, when I got done with comps, um, I took the time to read for pleasure, and one of those books that I listened to on tape was Talking to Strangers from Malcolm Gladwell, and he looked at instances where in high rich environments when it's talking person to person uh, there are instances where it's easier to deceive people because there's so much more information going on that it's hard to focus in on certain cues um, and so he said that in those environments we can find results where we may trick ourselves and just coming fresh off of comps i was reminded of a paper from adam grant in 2013 where he talked about before he sent out a survey to um, some individuals in an organization, he included a video that basically was himself telling them about how important the study was and how he needed them to participate in order for them to be, have solid findings. And so the practice of proceeding something like a traditional survey method with an informative video hinges on this untested assumption that doing so will improve the quality of participant responses. Video in management research is becoming much more prevalent. And a lot of that stems from the idea that it's affordable, the availability is now there, you can use your iPhone or whatever other type of camera you may have available, and they're fairly easy to use. Point, shoot, record, and you're ready to go. 
within organizations like this Zoom meeting we're having today, it's being recorded. And so we have rich sources of archival data using videos. Uh, we have a wealth of information from YouTube where we can use video in our research and management. Um, and we are also seeing where we're starting to expand that option where we as researchers are using video ourselves to incorporate with traditional methods. Now, when we do this, we're kind of implicitly drawing on media richness theory. Uh, media richness theory um, in a basic sentence describes that the task performance will improve when the task information matches the medium's information richness. Now, this richness is the medium's ability to be able to improve information processing within a specific time interval. So if we have just a standard email that we send out, kind of a non-interactive media, um, you read it within your own perspective. You put your own tone to it. Uh, there's not really a lot of richness that the individual writing it can express. Sure, we can use italics, quotation marks, um, but there's a lot of missed richness in that type of context. Whereas the best case scenario would be face-to-face -face, where we are talking with somebody and we can see, are they starting to doze off? Are they starting to lose attention? And so those rich cues that we are sending with nonverbal signals, the background that we have with us are all processing information, um, which can influence the way that we handle the tasks that we're assigned to. And so looking at just a task that we would ask typical respondents to do, um, organizational researchers are very commonly um, interested in the idea of creativity, which is the idea of coming up with new, novel, and useful ideas. Uh, for example, CEOs identify creativity as one of the key factors for their employees in order for the firm to be successful. And so managers can do unique things to encourage creativity um, and encourage their employees to express the value in being creative. Um, so we would naturally assume that having this rich medium where they can use their vocal tone and their backgrounds and other things, um, they can encourage their employees to be creative um, if they need to use a video context. Um, in that same vein, when we send out a survey, we want to have the best data available. We want to make sure that the people taking our survey are engaged. Um, one of the things that management researchers are looking at and trying to make sure that they um, control for as often as possible is this idea of insufficient effort responding. This can make data less insightful. Um, and it can potentially lead to inaccurate results depending on how large the, the impact is from this um, insufficient effort. Uh, there are multiple different types of insufficient effort responding. You can have random responses. Um, if you remember taking those kind of bubble fill in Scantron tests, you can just fill in random ones. Non-random or repeat can be just filling in C for all of the options. Um, or you can have inconsistent responses if you have a repeat measure and you answer it one way for the first question and another way for the second. To counteract this, uh, management scholars have used a bunch of different tools, timed responses, bogus questions, like I have 16 fingers, not quite accurate. So that would uh, be options where you can check and see, is the participant paying attention? Um, and so we would assume that this rich environment, we can stress, we don't want to have those illogical responses. And so we'd see fewer of them when using a video introduction. Now within this, we have a video with a rich medium. We are seeing somebody. And so drawing on social identity theory, uh, we know that individuals categorize themselves into various characteristics um, and to provide kind of a self-group concept. I'm from Auburn, I go to school here, I buy into Auburn athletics, I buy into wearing Auburn clothing. Um, and then we can make social comparisons uh, between groups that we have um, kind of as shown in the cartoon on the screen. Um, we can be favorable to one group and this can improve our self-esteem for belonging there, or we may be in an out group and we feel like we don't belong. And so this idea of homophily is the attraction and the preference for individuals who resemble oneself. Uh, research shows that in a social environment, this idea of homophily is a quick way that we kind of decide, do I fit in here? Is this somebody that I can connect with. Um, and that can be something as simple and easy to see as someone's, you know, gender or their ethnicity, um, or it can be other factors that connect you to that individual. And so we would guess that when actors and participants are not the same, uh, they will weaken the effects that we proposed 
from the first two direct relationships. And so for our survey design, we uh, distributed our survey through Qualtrics. Everyone received an IRB compliant information letter. Um, and if they were in the control group or kind of that condition one, that was all they received was that kind of static standard traditional letter that we send at the beginning of surveys. Some of the participants also received a non-university affiliated video, as you can see on the left, or a university affiliated video on the right. Um, as you can see, we got the best actor that money could buy. Um, on his CV, it says that his mother uh, said he has a face for radio. So uh, we hope that didn't influence the results, but um, we did the best we could with the talent that we had. Our sample was 888 undergraduate students from two SEC universities. Uh, these two can be described as rivals um, as far as universities and the athletic arena. Um, and so those two samples were where we drew our population for this study. Our dependent variable, as mentioned, are creative responses. Uh, to measure this, we did the alternative uses task. Um, this is where the individuals had two minutes to name as many uses as they could for a brick, like you might use to build a building. For the illogical responses, we um, requested access for the conditional reasoning test for aggression, or CRTA. Um, this is commonly used to measure um, implicit aggression, and it also has a measure for illogical responses. And then our moderating variable was represented by the actor in the video wearing either business attire or the Auburn polo. So for our results, we see that the direct relationship between the video introduction and creative responses is non-significant, so we do not find support for our first hypothesis. And the same thing for illogical responses. Uh, we find no support for that direct relationship. But when we bring in the moderator, we can see that this dissimilarity leads to an increase in the number of the logical responses and a decrease in the number of creative responses. So one of the reasons for that non-finding in the first group is because we're probably seeing kind of an X interaction that are canceling out that first effect because our two samples are being influenced by this moderator. That idea that they don't fit in with the actor on the screen um, and so maybe they don't quite try quite as hard on the CRTA and maybe they don't try quite as hard to come up with creative uses for a break. So general, yeah. We have a lot of time, it's 10 minutes, so you want to- No win? problem. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions about it, um, happy to answer them later, um, but I will stop sharing the screen so we can move on. Thank you, Jacob. And please guys, I know we are uh, you know, moving fast. So if you have any questions for any presenter, you can use the chat uh, function too to talk to them privately or uh, with everyone as you want. Uh, Paul, you go next. Paul is from University of Mississippi. Yes, thank you. Um, all right, there we go. Hello everyone, my name is Paul Sronilas and I'm a PhD student at the University of Mississippi as the Dr. Gupta said. And today I'll be presenting the preliminary results of the ongoing meta-analysis on organizational vision that Drs. Gao, Kim, Wu, and myself are currently working on. Vision has been studied at different levels and different scope, and it's been broadly defined in, the, in different literatures. Some identify vision as a type of leadership, others as a component of organizational climate, and others say that it's a statement of direction. So we decided to focus on just organizational vision, which we define as a statement of an organization's desirable future or future state. Organizational vision is often in public form and delivers an important message to both internal and external stakeholders. And for the purposes of this presentation, I will simply refer to it as vision from here on. Some of these management fields include strategy, OBE, and entrepreneurship. Um, strategy scholars argue that it provides a coherent direction for business strategies and it reduces the uncertainty for strategic leaders um, to make daily decisions. OB scholars have emphasized the motivational function of vision and its use as a key characteristic of effective leadership. Finally, vision is also very important in entrepreneurial settings because it can be communicated with external stakeholders like investors um, and that reduces the information asymmetry 
that there might be um, so that they may obtain financial resources. Although management scholars have acknowledged the positive influence of vision on organizations, the field has provided little direction on the extent to which vision characteristics matter and when they matter more or less. And more specifically, there's limited consensus on the financial benefits of vision and uh, its characteristics. For example, um, drawing on traditional economics, scholars even consider vision just to be pure rhetoric with no effect over performance. And according to them, vision is cheap talk because it's costless. And this represents our first research question. We want to find out if there are any financial benefits of having a vision. Our second research question concerns vision attributes and when they matter the most. Um, research on vision attributes leading to performance remains unclear. Um, for example, while some scholars defend that shared vision is profitable, others argue that vision may not receive proper buy-in and so it may be useless. Moreover, some evidence shows that boldness of vision can arouse employees' emotions uh, and motivate them to work harder, which results in better performance. Um, but others have also found that bold vision can have a negative influence on performance. And so to answer our two research questions, we are conducting this meta-analysis um, because it's one, a suggested way to make sense of a broadly defined vision in different literatures. And two, our study provides the advantages of any meta-analysis where the corrected statistical artifacts improve precision when we are comparing them with individual studies. And so here we have our hypothesis. As we can see, we believe that all three show positive relationships. Um, for our first hypothesis, vision has been regarded as a way to provide a sense of direction. Um, and vision has a strong motivational effect over employees that may translate into financial returns. For our second hypothesis, vision theories argue that vision should be shared among key organizational members to effectively guide strategic decisions which can improve um, performance. And last but not least, having a bold vision strengthens its directional and motivational effects, and it may represent a source of attention from major stakeholders, which will result in higher investments. We initially selected the uh, leading management journals, which resulted in the first 16 journals listed on the left column of the, of the table one. We also extended uh, the journal list by using a meta-analysis on mission statements, and we used that as a reference point. Um, and that included the journal list that you all can see in the right column of the table. And I'd like to point out once again that this is an ongoing project and we plan to extend this to conduct an exhaustive search of the literature. So we followed the three main conditions um, as our selection criteria. First, we only retained empirical papers that included in, um, important statistical information such as correlations. Second, we included studies that measure shared vision and vision boldness at the organizational level only. Um, and third, we dropped studies that don't report any information related to financial performance. So from the 9,536 initial entries, um, we obtained a total of 34 effect sizes um, across 10,148 organizations. And here we have the main variables analyzed for organizational vision. We define it as a statement of a firm's desirable future or future state. We conceptualize shared vision as a degree to which vision is shared among employees or communicated to employees. And finally, we consider a vision to be bold when an aspect of the vision is associated with being purposeful, confident, passionate, and so forth. Once we selected and coded our sample, we followed the meta-analytic procedures um, recommended by Hunter and Smith that probably most of you are familiar with. And here's the table with the preliminary results of this meta. 
we obtain support for H1 as we find that there's a positive relationship between vision and performance. We also find support for H2 as shared vision seems to have a positive impact on performance. Um, and then what it, we think that is more interesting here is that the link was substantially stronger than the corrected mean correlation between the overall vision and performance as it's shown by the non-overlapping 95% confidence interval. And uh, finally, although H3 is not supported, the significant Q statistics and credibility intervals indicate that there may be potential moderators affecting this relationship. Based on the preliminary results of this ongoing meta, we draw some conclusions. First, although weak, we find evidence that supports the link between vision and firm performance. And so having a vision does not seem to be cheap talk as those companies that have one enjoy its economic returns. Second, we also show that vision should be shared and well communicated throughout the organization. Um, so maybe future research can study how this process of vision formulation and implementation uh, may affect shared vision. And lastly, given that we don't find support for our bold vision hypothesis, we suggest that scholars look at when bold vision can be beneficial or risky for organizational performance to, be, um, to better understand this relationship. This is it. I will take any questions or any suggestions that you guys may have for this ongoing project. Thank you. Questions are welcome if anyone has questions. Uh, I have a question about the meta-analysis. So in terms of the vision, I, I'm not sure, but uh, there may be some archival data about the existence of the visions and what the vision is for these companies, the financial returns for the company. Uh, is, is there any archival data that we can pull from uh, in addition to this meta-analysis from uh, the papers? Owners? Mm. Yeah, th this is a good question. Um, one way that we, uh, that we were trying to see if uh, we can find more um, data on vision, for example, is there's a software that tracks websites. And so you can see if uh, companies have had a vision um, for over a certain period of time. And so we may be looking at this in the future because um, usually with archival data is sort of complicated to find um, relevant data that we may use with all the correlations that we would need. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. With that, we'll move to the next speaker, Katie Crawford from Auburn. Yes, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> all right, sorry about that. Uh, we're all like testing our, whatever our new headphone setup is. Um, I know we're here at the end of the day, um, I can see that everyone has lost their natural light. Everyone's in central time. So I'll hopefully be able to get through this pretty quickly. Um, but I, my name is Katie Crawford Alexander. I'm a third year doctoral student at Auburn University. And I'll be uh, presenting a paper uh, on behalf of some co-authors and I. Um, this paper is called Portrait of a Workplace Deviant. Uh, it was kind of envisioned the this original motivation. I wrote it as uh, initially in, as a seminar. Uh, and then brought on, we have uh, kind of a large uh, group of team members that help collect the data. Um, and it is now has a conditional acceptance at Journal of Applied Psychology. So um, hopefully you enjoy it and uh, we'll get a little feedback on future projects. Sure. So it's a clearer picture of the big five and the dark triad as predictors of workplace deviance. Um, so the purpose of our study was to synthesize competing perspectives uh, by examining the incremental effects of the dark triad beyond the big five for predicting workplace deviance. I've always been very interested in this dark side of personality. Um, and when we think about deviance, we, we think of these kind of two streams of personality research that are going on in tandem, um, but not necessarily together. And so this particular paper intends to contribute to the literature by using meta-analytic techniques to explain the effects of employee personality uh, on both interpersonally and organizationally directed workplace deviance. 
So what is workplace deviance? Many of us, uh, at least if you're in the OB space, probably have some familiarity of it. It's the voluntary behavior that violates the significant organizational norms, and in so doing threatens the well-being of the organi organization, its members, or both. Um, so we see it in two forms. Interpersonal workplace deviance, Easy examples are someone being cursed out by, uh, an, or, or you know, actually cursing at and someone else, or being extremely rude to someone in their workplace or a coworker. Whereas organizational workplace deviance is more targeted to the organization itself. It could be physical theft, um, but other items include things like spending too too much time daydreaming um, or time theft itself. So that brings us to the personality frameworks that we looked at for this particular study. The first framework being the big five personality traits. Again, many of us are probably familiar with big five, conscientiousness, being dependable and organized, agreeableness, being cooperative and courteous, uh, emotional stability, um, in, in, and when we look at it from the spectrum of neuroticism versus emotional stability, those who are emotionally stable are calm, collected, and grounded. Uh, whereas openness to experience is creativity, being more imaginative and venturous in nature. And then that leads us to the last form of big five is extroversion, being talkative and sociable and enjoying social environments. So in contrast, we look at the dark triads. The dark triad are these negative personality traits, sometimes considered antisocial in nature. So the first is Machiavellianism, which is the manipulation of others for personal gain. Um, we sometimes affiliate it with politics, um, sort of these negative uh, snakes in the grass kind of ideas uh, of, of a personality that many of us would not want to be manipulating us behind closed doors or behind our backs. Um, then you have narcissism. Uh, many of us can think of an example of someone who's quite narcissistic. We saw, heard a paper on hubris that's extreme narcissism, um, but feelings of superiority above others. And then the last being psychopathy. So this is extreme selfishness with a lack of remorse. Uh, and, and ultimately, we were using the social, uh, social exchange theory and the social exchange framework to better understand and to hypothesize uh, which, frame, which personality framework would drive more workplace deviance. Um, so according to social exchange theory, relationships are developed and maintained through interdependent interactions between parties over time. It especially, it's especially useful for our study because it emphasized its emphasis on norms for establishing behavioral expectations aligned to the conceptualization of workplace deviance. Again, those organizational norms um, as behavior that violates these established norms within organizations. And most notably, we drew from some original research and original conceptualizations of social exchange as it relates to social relations and that they rest directly on these psychological dispositions. Uh, and we conceptualize that from the perspective of personality. Um, these psychological dispositions of big five traits versus dark, tri dark triad traits. So these are our hypotheses. The dark triad will predict incremental variance in interpersonal deviance and organizational deviance beyond the effects of big five. And again, because these dark side of the personality we anticipate will be more affiliated with, uh, with workplace deviance forms. And then the second hypothesis, the dark triad will be relatively stronger predictors of interpersonal deviance and organizational deviance than the big five. Uh, and so the way we uh, conducted this study is we created a meta-analytic correlation, correlation matrix um, so that we can use matrix regression and relative weight analysis to test our hypotheses. We used the results from prior meta-analyses for relationships between the big five and both forms of workplace deviance, as well as the relationship between interpersonal and organizational workplace deviance. Um, so when you think about the, the model as, as we normally talk about for papers, this is a 16 relationship model. Right, we're looking at the eight personality traits as they relate to interpersonal and the eight personality traits as they relate to organizational deviance. Um, the only correlations that were unavailable in the literature were those associated with the dark triad uh, personality traits and the both forms of organizational deviance. So we estimated meta-analytic correlations for those relationships. Uh, and we'll show you the results right here. So in table one of our paper, um, we show the results for these um, meta-analytic estimates. Um, we just saw a meta, and many of you have probably read many a meta, uh, but you will see that um, we, we really did find some strong Ks, and we show positive relationships um, for all forms of dark triad, 
with interpersonal deviance and all, all forms of the dark triad and organizational deviance. Um, not too surprising, um, but what's more interesting is what we were able to accomplish with relative weight analysis. Um, so here you'll see that we were able to show for interpersonal deviance um, more variance explained with the addition of the dark triad. And more importantly, we were able to show these relative weight analyses um, at pretty high levels to explain the overall variance. So you'll see for interpersonal, um, the highest being psychopathy for the explained variance, next being uh, Machiavellianism followed by agreeableness, um, which is interesting when you think about low and agreeableness or disagreeableness, it, it makes sense that that is negatively, re very strongly re negatively related um, with interpersonal deviance on the positive side, um, agreeableness being the positive side. And then that brings us to organizational deviance. Again, we're able to show this more incremental variance explained with the inclusion of the dark triad. Um, and then uh, interestingly, again, um, we see for on the positive side, conscientiousness being very much you know, negatively related to organizational deviance and explaining almost 35% of the variance. Again, conscientiousness, dependable. We normally affiliate it with high performers, those who are timely, those who have good time management skills. Um, so again, we would anticipate those people to not engage in organizational deviance. Um, but then from the dark triad perspective, uh, we see Machiavellianism and psychopathy, again, explaining a lot of that variance. Um, I think most interesting, we also see that narcissism doesn't explain much of the variance um, for any of those who study narcissism, that might be an interesting takeaway. Um, so this key takeaways, again, we look at Psychopathy, uh, Machiavellianism, and agreeableness are the strongest predictors for the interpersonal deviance, and then conscientiousness, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism being the strongest predictors of organizational deviance. So our results uh, have the potential to provide value to managers and organizations by offering them a greater understanding of which employees are likely to engage in workplace deviance. This is the idea of a portrait of a workplace deviant, right? We're painting this picture of who engages and who does not. And then lastly, our major contributions, we synthesize this largely independent perspectives, light versus dark traits on the relationship between personality facets and workplace deviance, which provides a more comprehensive personality profile of those who are prone to engage in workplace deviance. Overall results indicate that different parts of the personality comprise our understanding of workplace deviance, but I think these are the big takeaways, right? Machiavellianism and psychopathy are the strongest predictors in tandem with either agreeableness, again, on that positive side for interpersonal deviance and conscientiousness on, uh, for the organizational deviance perspective. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, hopefully we have maybe a minute or two for questions, uh, but I really appreciate the opportunity to present this paper. Thank you, Katie. If anyone has questions, please feel free to ask. You can also message Katie directly using the chat function. Uh, the next speaker is Victoria Antin Yates from Mississippi State. Okay, can you guys see my screen? And hopefully hear me? Okay. Um, yes, okay. Uh, all right, so um, my paper is called uh, Extending Relational Perspectives on Women's Compensation Negotiation via Network Perspectives of Identity, Social Support, and Structure, which is definitely a mouthful. Um, uh, as Katie mentioned, it's the end of the day here. I know everyone's ready to wind down. And so this is going to be the very condensed version of this paper. Uh, if anyone wants to chat more, has any questions, please do reach out to me. My email is here at the bottom um, and we will get started. Okay, so um, negotiation um, for compensation or promotions is really important in the literature, especially early in the career, because it can affect overall um, career trajectories and lifetime earnings of employees. But the um, current research 
shows that women are much less likely to negotiate than men. And even when women do negotiate, they frequently don't reap as many benefits as their male counterparts do. Um, so first, they're unlikely to gain as much through negotiation as men do, so they're going to get a lower raise um, than many of their male counterparts. And then second, women who negotiate often experience these negative social outcomes, such as social retribution. And so often, coworkers um, will dislike women who negotiate, or in some studies, they're even um, people who refuse to work with women who have negotiated. So um, existing research has suggested kind of in response to this that women take a relational rhetorical stance when negotiating uh, in order to kind of overcome these problems. So in other words, um, women should highlight their organizational embeddedness and their relationships in the organization when they negotiate in order to appeal to these kind of gendered role norms in which women um, are not um, as, a, as agentic as men and they're um, more embedded in relationships than um, a male worker would be. Um, so in response, uh, we kind of take this approach um, towards this issue from a social network perspective to explore how uh, relationships in terms of network structure and content can influence a female employee's likelihood to negotiate uh, as well as the outcomes of that negotiation. Um, so let's see, I think I might have. No, we're good. Okay. So uh, we use a couple of theories in this paper because we are interested in how women can, how women specifically can enhance their workplace negotiations. We use identity theory to argue that women who have more um, highly relational self construals, uh, meaning the more that they define their own selves based on um, how they relate to others and define themselves in terms of their relationships, will be less likely to negotiate than women who have more of an independent self construal. Uh, we also use socio-analytic theory, uh, which talks about how human behavior is really driven by these two needs of getting along with others as well as getting ahead, um, you know, gaining status, uh, to talk about how uh, women can experience both uh, positive and negative outcomes. Um, Specifically, we use socioanalytic theory to discuss how network centrality can help minimize the negative social outcomes of negotiation and how structural holes, uh, which is a very specific form of like um, power through the network, can help maximize the positive negotiation outcomes. Um, and then finally, we use um, network theory, obviously, and we argue that women's social networks will moderate these influences. And we use, we're looking specifically at homophily um, in terms of gender, multiplexity, which is just kind of like uh, how the ties overlap. So are you friends and you work together, um, structural holes and centrality. So this is our full model here. here. Um, and Victoria, you, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we can't see your slides. We only see the first slide. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you, but. Thank you so much. Can you welcome. see it now? No, we just see the first slide. You may need to change your screen sharing. Okay. Oh, I see all the messages. Okay. Let's try this. Can y'all see this? Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's good. The, the other slides, the previous slides, those were just like words. Um, I can share it with you guys if you want, but I basically hit all the high points. Um, this one has the model on it, so thank you so much for stopping me there, Jamie. Um, so as you can see now, we uh, suggest that gender homophily um, can exacerbate the effects of interdependent self controls onto negotiation. Um, so basically, if a woman is has a highly relational self construal and there's a lot of um, other women in her network, this can make that effect um, worse, where we uh, suggest that multiplexity can minimize that relationship. And then looking at the back end of the model, uh, we argue that women who are central in their networks, who have a lot of relationships, will face fewer negative social outcomes from negotiation than um, women. And then we also suggest that women who have high structural holes, which is kind of this like brokerage role in the network, um, uh, but that provides social power, can uh, in turn maximize their compensation increases. 
So we are currently in the process of collecting data. We've already collected the first wave of data and we'll be collecting a second wave, which includes um, namely the uh, negative social outcomes as well as the information on compensation uh, in the second wave, which will be beginning in February. Um, we're using scale items to collect interdependent self-controls, um, negotiation, and negative social outcomes in the workplace, including uh, we're looking at incivility, gossip, and ostracism. And then uh, on the social network side, we're following Perry et al. And we're using the name generator and interpreter method to collect egocentric network data, um, which is network data on the respondent's personal network. Um, on communication and friendship networks. So for example, we ask um, the respondents to name up to 10 individuals that they regularly communicate with on work-related matters. And then respondents provide, um, after they list those people, they then answer a number of questions and provide a variety of information on those individuals, including, um, but not limited to, like their relationships with each other. Uh, and then compensation is a self-report, um, compensation increase. So um, from this data, we will calculate um, network homophily, multiplexity, structural holes, and centrality using um, Steve Bargatti's eNet software, which was created specifically for this type of egocentric network data. And then once we have all those scores, we're actually just going to use OLS regression. Um, so I know that was really quick, and I apologize for the slide issue. I'm definitely not a Zoom master. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, thanks, guys. If anyone has any questions for Victoria, please feel free to ask. Thank you all for your questions. Um, uh, thank you all for your presentations and for your sustained involvement, even as we uh, get to the evening, as someone said, natural light is gone and we are in artificial light. So uh, now we move on to the last part of the consortium today, which is the social, uh, social, uh, virtual social. I had originally called it social hour and Paul reminded me that it's not gonna be an hour. It's only 30 minutes. So here's what we are gonna do. We are gonna do 10 minutes each of uh, breakout rooms and we'll be randomly allocated to different breakout rooms so that we talk to random people on this call. And so uh, there's gonna be three breakout sessions. So we finish at six and then whoever wants to hang out after six can uh, can uh, can hang out uh, after six, so that's uh, that's my idea. Uh, let me see if I can make it make it work. So here we go. Hey Jeff, did that work well? Yeah, we're. I mean, like I were said, we're figuring out as we go. Okay. It, it, we got into the room really well. Um, but the conversation? Well, I, I mean, I, I think we might need a motivating structure of some sort. You know, like something that, 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 uh, um, that moves, make, makes everyone offer someone up. I mean, we, we all got to talking, but in terms of getting it to happen quickly. And we, I came up with, we came up with the idea to have a um, Zoom Olympics. Can we call it that? What is that? Yeah, I like that. Uh, we just, I don't know, uh, uh, Dr. Martin Natale, talked about... good to see you again. Yeah, we, we, all, we all do uh, burpees, and we see who drops burpees. first. Oh, God. Y'all ready? Let's go. Let's do it. I I get up. Not gonna be a <laughs> I'll do one more. <laughs> I said I'll just record a couple on Panopto and just put it on a repeat and just, you know, project that. Copy and paste, copy and paste. <laughs> we started with 60 people at 2 p.m. and now we are about 38 people. So I think that's, that's not bad. <laughs> Michelle, if this was a longitudinal study, I'd be excited about that retention rate. <laughs> <laughs> Overjoyed, in fact. I, I think you guys have done a great job putting this on. I mean, you know, we got a pile of us here. And, uh, you know, the, uh, um, 
I mean, we've got a pile of us here, and uh, and one advantage is none of us have to had to drive four to eight hours. <laughs> is Jack and all the hotels and booked up? Maria still there? Yeah. What? I'm here. Oh. Yeah. Okay, Maria, you there? Jack, Ben? Yes, I'm here. Okay, perfect. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm hoping next year. Uh, we can host the event, provide you guys with some uh, drinks and some food, and kind of do the same thing again. But, Down at Auburn, is it? Is that where you? I. That's what I would like to do. I mean, it's open for discussion. Nothing set in stone, but uh, we have know, that. We all hosted Tusk in Tuscaloosa last year, so it's kind of our turn, I think, to repay the favor for sure. Yeah. Well, you've got that great open area, you know, yeah. that you guys built. Yeah. Outside. Yeah, no, we, uh, we have you a mean the, uh, the porch, Jeff. Yeah, that yeah. roof pop is gorgeous. We can be socially distanced and everything, and not, you know. Yeah, assuming we can have gatherings more than you know twenty people, we uh, we'll see what we can do. Well, maybe in twenty twenty two, I can get my new boss to uh, con convince to have, let us host here in Starful. So. That'd be so exciting. Yeah. Be great. Victoria all ran a car and drive our students. Someday we're gonna have the building they're building across the our, our street up that's supposed to be our new business school. I'm hmm. wondering what that'll have in it for gatherings. Wow. I didn't know you guys are getting a new bit new building. Oh they've been yeah, they've been uh they've been building that thing for a while. Uh so yeah, it's a. Uh, it, it was probably tough because it's where they set up all the game day tents for you know, and they rented out that space. So that was a lot of money to give up that field. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll hang out here for about five, seven, ten minutes, I guess, until six ten. And you know, if anyone wants to go whenever you want to go, that's good. Thank you all for for this. Uh, if I hope you all stay in touch. I, I hope we all stay in touch with each other. Uh, I'm relatively easy to find as are most of my colleagues. Uh, for, this is especially for the students, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But I hope uh, you know you guys stay in touch with each other as well as with the faculty. Uh, right, Maria, Jack, Ben, any thoughts? Sounds good. Yeah, that, that sounds great, Vishal. Thank you again for uh, coordinating all this. Um, I hope I hope all the students were able to uh, uh, meet some new people and learn a few things. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody again at the next event, whether it's virtual or hopefully at some point in person. So, yeah, well, Does anybody know what's going on with MMRC this year? That's a great question. I'll ask Chuck. And uh, yeah, hope, yeah, Chuck probably knows what he's planning. Because wasn't it going, supposed to be at Memphis, I think? That was my understanding, but I do not know for sure. I do not know. For those of the, you who, who don't know what MMRC is, if you're the first year student, MMRC is uh, a similar event to this, uh, the Mid-South Management Research Consortium. Uh, it attracts a larger number of schools and the idea is for students and faculty to come together to network. It usually happens in the spring semester. Is that a good summary? Yes, I would say that's an accurate description. <laughs> Last year it was at Auburn and they did an amazing job hosting. In fact, that's the last real conference I went to. So Same. It was I, the uh, last social event, right? Yeah. 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 It was, boom. I th yeah, I think we sh shut down two, two, maybe three weeks later. I think yeah. that's right, Mel. Yeah. Yep. That was that's it. the last time I saw most of you in person. That was so. the last, that was the last hurrah. And I wonder if anybody uh, that was sick after that was, it was actually because of COVID rather than whatever seasonal flu yeah. or cold. I'm curious. Yeah, we'll never know. There's no telling. <laughs> but um, based on what I remember us discussing, Memphis was going to host it in 21, but I don't know what. Because what I'm wondering if 
uh, looking at the data, I think that 2022 MMRC will would could be in person looking at the way things are developing. Hmm. So what I'm wondering is if he wants to commit to that, if some other university could can, could do this online -y thing and then he can just commit to doing the in-person thing. I don't know. Oh, we can volunteer him here and now. Let's vote. Okay, everybody. Also, you know, at, 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 a, at a date, I'm sure our dean would like to show off her new building once yeah. they get that too. For sure. Together. Yeah. Maybe we'd be 2022 or something. I don't yeah. know. I don't know what the schedule is for that anymore. Yeah. Just well, maybe you guys can commit to 2023. What? So maybe you guys can commit to 2023. Yeah. It was Michelle, great. Si sign the agreement for us. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> a conference with a few friends and we all decided. Yes. Done. Yeah. Coalition influence AOM tactics. already moved online, right? So the yeah. likelihood that MMRC or any other thing will happen in the morning, uh, in the first half of 2021. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to official. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking 2022, 2023 at this point. Yeah. I think we're a year and a half away from in person events yeah. of, of much of a sort. Optimistic. I think the soonest thing that might happen is SMA next year. Optimistically, I think that's the most optimistic I could be. SMA in New Orleans would be amazing. I hope it goes. I hope we have it in New Orleans. Me too. I've always thought New Orleans was a bad place for a conference. There's too many other things to do. No, that's why it's a good place. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. All there is in a hurricane. You're, oh, you're, you'd be the puniest minority in that view, Jeremy, I think. Well, you know, Mel, I always like presenting to an empty room. <laughs> no. Which did actually happen to me one time as a, as a PhD student. I think it was my third year, my second academy. I'm in this room and I'm the only one there. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm in the wrong room. Nope. You the were. other three papers did not show up. <laughs> when, I, no. when we had the Hawaii conference. What? Oh, yeah. When we had the Hawaii conference. Yeah. Uh, I was the like, one. I had a session on like the yeah. last day in the afternoon yeah. and it was me and the other presenters. Yeah. So we just sat in a circle and talked about our papers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I mine think was mine was at uh, Disney. Yeah. And we were in Orlando. Yeah. Apparently yeah. everyone else wanted to go see the uh, the giraffes or something. Yeah. Yeah, o Hawaii is a tough one. <laughs> only only the presenters show up. Yeah. And and, and you don't have to be the final session. Yeah, we, this was like a 3 p.m. E type one. It was on the last day, but not the last of the last. Yeah. All right, guys, I'm going to have to head out, but I, I enjoyed it. Thank you again like to for, uh, for putting this together. Uh, yeah. Did a great job. So uh, hopefully right. we'll stay in touch. And, uh, Bravo. Well yeah. done. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks Harvey. Thanks so long, everybody. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everybody. See you all. Bye-bye. Take care. Anyone wants to? Yeah. Please feel free. Lisa, enjoy your kickboxing. Ben, the yeah. cow just really ran uphill on that one. Yes, it did. You, you ran them all out. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Michelle. Thank you so much for putting it on. Thank and, you. Uh, appreciate it. Look so, at how much we get done when the four campuses get together, right? I mean, we got it. Everything worked out well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we should do more things with the campuses, you know, working together. We should. We definitely should. Definitely should. So the question is, who's going to volunteer to uh, to organize the online MMRC? That's a question for Chuck. That's yeah, his baby. Before we make any you know, decisions on our own. Let's ask what he has in mind. I agree with you, Michelle.
because he may be thinking this is going to be a cheap one for Memphis, right? Do it online. Ah, a <laughs> little, little, little sneak there. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. He might be thinking that. All right. Well, one fewer things I have to do. Or you, Vishal. Or you, Ben. It was good seeing you guys, Ben, Vishal, Lisa. See you later, Jamie. I know I came by See, Jamie. <laughs> See you later, Lisa. So, Lisa, kickboxing? Okay, I thought you were saying something, then I got back on. Um, yeah, you ready? I, I don't understand what this is. What? How can you do online kickboxing? Oh, it's just Zoom. Yeah, but I, I don't understand. Is this like, like... Oh, you don't have any t equipment. It's just like kicks and punches. Oh, I see. Yeah. It's doable. Where do you Very do doable. that, Lisa? How? Where and when? Where? In my bedroom. <laughs> no, like, do, like do, is this one of your training sessions or what, what is it? Yeah, it's just, it's just a group of people I know that wanted to work out. So it's like 10 of us, but usually there's like four or five of us on at a time. I do, I do it every day, but... I mean, you know, all during the weekdays, but um, it's fun. Like, my family does it, so I get to see my family doing it, too. Mm. So good. Well, have fun with that. Thanks. Gonna go. Bye, y'all. See, see you, Lisa. You.